Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Zussman, and I am a research director at the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies in Hayama, Japan. Uh, we're delighted to welcome you today to um, our workshop. Uh, this is the EANET YASA International Workshop entitled Strengthening the Science Policy Interface for Clean Air and a Sustainable Future uh, in Asia. And um, uh, for today's workshop, uh, we have uh, the honor of having with us uh, colleagues not only from uh, uh, EANET in uh, Niigata, Japan, but uh, YASA, uh, the International Institute for Implied Systems Analysis in Luxembourg, Austria, as well as my home institute, the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies and uh, Kyoto University. Uh, the workshop is supported by the Ministry of Environment of Japan, and uh, we look forward to having a lively and uh, very candid exchange about how we can strengthen the science policy interface for clean air and a sustainable future. Um, since we have a very uh, packed agenda, uh, I'd like to uh, turn it over to um, uh, the executive director of uh, my home institute, IGIS, uh, Mr. Yasuo Takahashi. Uh, Takahashi-san will begin by offering us some uh, opening remarks. And then we'll turn it over to Bert Fabian from uh, EANET. So uh, uh, Takahashi Shicho, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Erickson, for your uh, introduction. Uh, dear friends and colleagues, uh, uh, my name is Yasuo Takahashi, uh, the executive director of uh, IGES. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very glad, delighted to welcome all of you and deliver opening remarks for the EANET EASA International Workshop on Strengthening the Science Policy Interface for Clean Air and Sustainable Future in Asia. Let me begin with a sobering fact. Every year, air pollution causes about 7 million deaths. This makes air pollution the greatest environmental threat to human health in Asia and globally. It also means that discussions today are vital to a healthy planet and people. Now, let me offer some good news. Not only have we made a progress in reducing air pollution, we also have a clearer understanding of its relationship with other environmental problems. Uh, for instance, an integrated approach to air pollution, climate change, and food security is gaining more attention in science and policy. Now let me add some additional good news. Uh, if done well, integration can save money lives and help achieve a sustainable future. In fact, our institute, IGES, is promoting integrated approaches to many SDGs. Most notably, earlier, in, earlier this year, uh, we hosted a large international conference that had highlighted the integration of our synergy, synergistic implementation across climate and the SDGs. Next, I want to under underline a critical point. While integration holds the key to sustainable future, it is not easy. One of the main cha challenges is another theme discussed today, strengthening the science policy interface. In many cases, good science does not result in good policy. Though better science does not always mean better policy, let me conclude with a final piece of good news. We can strengthen connections between science and policy with frank exchanges across different disciplines, countries, and groups of people. Today's workshop is therefore designed to support the free flow of ideas between colleagues in Japan and prominent researchers at all the International Institute, at the International Institute for Applied Science and Syst Applied Systems Analysis, EASA, in Austria. This exchange, in my view, uh, essential to achieving clean air and a sustainable future in Asia. It is that, in that spirit that I encourage everyone's active participation in today's workshop. I would like to conclude my remarks by expecting fruitful discussions today. Thank you very much. Okay, hey, thank you so much, uh, Takahashi Shicho, for giving us uh... Uh, these very encouraging remarks and uh, also um, motivating us to engage in a lively discussion. 
I now like to turn it over to uh, um, colleague uh, Mr. Bert Fabian, uh, who is the coordinator of the Secretariat for the EANet. And uh, Bert will uh, also give us a, a few opening remarks that will hopefully open the door to uh, some good exchanges. So over to you, Bert. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, Mr. Takahashi, uh, friends of the Network Center and I just, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon. Uh, it is certainly my pleasure uh, to contribute to this event and uh, to give uh, the opening remarks as well uh, in this event. I think this issue of strengthening policy and uh, policy development and science is becoming more important. And uh, it's certainly a pleasure to see more organizations adhering to this. In the United Nations Environment Program, we are also encouraging strengthening the science policy interface. As we all know, and many of us have worked in this topic for a long time, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals it highlights uh, many of these issues, like in SDG3, uh, targets 3.9.1, uh, which uh, uh, calls for substantial reduction in deaths and illnesses from air pollution. The target 7.1.2, which aims to uh, ensure access to clean energy, which can result to less, emission, less emissions. Uh, targets 11.6.2, which uh, directly asks for reducing environmental impacts of cities by improving air quality. Um, these sustainable development goals and many others are actually complementary to uh, improving clean air and uh, promoting sustainable development. I was looking at the agenda for today and uh, I think it's very exciting to see uh, contributions from many organizations, uh, reference to studies and also uh, moving uh, uh, or charting the way forward. Perhaps maybe I can also offer a few, maybe three things uh, to contribute to the discussion. I think from my experience, uh, one main issue is communicating the results. We have done many studies. There are so many great organizations like IGES, like IASA, like ENET, uh, working on uh, uh, looking at the impacts of uh, air pollution in cities, in health, in ecosystems. And I think it's for us, uh, scientists, experts, on how to maybe package the results better and communicate it better. One is to the public, definitely. Another is policymakers. And another is for decision makers. So maybe we need to go beyond uh, what we improve in terms of the science, of the science and the results and get it across to those people who are developing policies and making the decisions. Another is uh, at this time, I think we need to go beyond uh, promoting the or working on a comprehensive uh, uh, air quality management framework, um, but also to start working on targeted policies and financing. You will probably hear later uh, many results saying that uh, major sources of air pollution are agricultural open burning, transportation, industries. Uh, many development organizations are also now starting to go and look at sectors. Uh, maybe in terms of developing policies and financing, we should also start looking at targeting specific uh, policies and financing for sectors. Another is, uh, sorry, on this uh, targeted policies, I, I said going beyond air quality management framework, but maybe I should highlight that this is very important, depending on the development of uh, or economic development of countries. Uh, definitely, the air quality management frameworks are important. Monitoring is also key, like how can we address what we cannot measure? Uh, we always hear this from many experts, and it's also up to us in terms of the scientific community uh, to help improve the monitoring. And then of course, linking it to policies. Uh, perhaps uh, last uh, of these three points is uh, improving the monitoring or strengthening the monitoring of the policies that we have done uh, or that have been developed and maybe doing some more follow-ups in terms of uh, looking at improvements. I mentioned many organizations have already working on this and many organizations are evolving. I saw this the same for ANET. 
And I'm very thankful that the participating countries in INET have decided to expand its scope, but also to develop what is called an INET project fund mechanism, which can start developing specific projects, looking at specific issues. And it can be done with uh, many other organizations. So I'm actually looking forward to working uh, with many organizations, partners of the INET, IGES, IASA, in further working with the participating countries who are representatives from uh, uh, East Asia and usually are the policy makers. They are not, all of them are not the decision makers, but they definitely contribute to making the, uh, or, or strengthening the science policy interface for policy making, and then maybe going beyond and linking it to uh, decision makers. Uh, thank you very much again uh, for inviting me to share these uh, opening remarks, and I look forward to the discussions. Um, throughout the day. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Bert, and uh, really appreciate you underlining the importance of uh, communication, uh, targeted policies, and how these might fit under the new and evolving framework of EANET. I think um, we have a, a very nice uh, agenda that's going to tie in well to some of the opening remarks and some of the discussions that's already started. And um, what I'd like to do now is uh, turn it over to uh, my colleague. Uh, um, uh, Fukunaga-san uh, from uh, the EA Net Center uh, in Niigata, and uh, he will be moderating the uh, first uh, session. And so, um, uh, Kenichiro Fukunaga, uh, the floor is uh, now yours. Thank you. Thank you, Eric-san, for your introduction. Uh, my name is Kenichiro Fukunaga, uh, Deputy Director General, Asia Center for Air Pollution Research, uh, designated as the Network Center for the EA Net. I am serving as the moderator of session one on behalf of Dr. Mo. Uh, session one is that multiple development benefits of coordinated actions to tackle air pollution is jointly organized by the uh, Acid Deposition Monitoring Network in East Asia, ENET, and the uh, International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, EASA. The monitoring analysis promoted by a project activity of the ENET is presented along with modeling analysis results from ongoing collaborative research projects between EASA and the Ministry of the Environment, Japan, MOEJ, on multiple development benefits of coordinated actions to tackle air pollution. Uh, today, we'd like to invite three presenters and uh, presenters and uh, one com commentator for the session one. After that, we have 10 minutes for Q&A. So all of you are welcome to raise your questions or share your thoughts about feeling via Q&A box. Now we move on to the uh, first presentation. Uh, we would like to invite Dr. Ken Yamashita, head of the planning and training department, Asia Center for Air Pollution Research, Network Center for the ENET. The floor is yours, Dr. Yamashita. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Fukunaga. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to be very, uh, very happy uh, to present uh, this uh, the first presentation here. So my presentation is Access to Air Pollution by INET. Uh, I'll share my presentation. Yes. <clears throat> so uh, the title is Access to Air Pollution by INET. So uh, I'd like to introduce uh, the very uh, the uh, common uh, information about the uh, air pollution and acid depolition. The left side, left uh, figure shows that uh, uh, pollution in the air we breathe can cause a wide range of adverse health impacts from respiratory illness to heart disease to stroke. Uh, this, this figure called it the silent killer. According to the World Health Organization, WHO, uh, is responsible for about 7 uh, million uh, premature deaths uh, each year by this uh, uh, air pollution. Mostly in poor and middle income countries, uh, reducing air pollution helps prevent uh, diseases and uh, untimely deaths, but also indirectly ensures economic stability and profits. 
uh, protects the environment, say the Health and Environmental uh, Alliance. And uh, the right figure uh, shows the assessing critical roles and uh, exceedance for acidification and eutrophication in the forests in East Asia and Southeast Asia. Uh, <clears throat> spatial variation in sulfur and nitrogen deposition have changed in East and Southeast Asia in recent decades. Uh, nevertheless, in this region, include, including the tropics, regional scale assessment of the long term risks of acidification and eutrophication, uh, in, in other words, in saturation for terrestrial ecosystem, ecosystem using the critical load approach, have not been updated since 2001. Uh, to evaluate future risks, map of critical loads and exceedance were updated using recently acquired special data sets of soil uh, properties, soil uh, minerals, climate, tree plantation, and the annual S uh, sulfate and uh, nitrate depositions estimated using the community uh, multi-scale air quality CMAC model. Uh, this is uh, the <clears throat> Uh, monitoring sites of ENET. ENET is the asset position monitoring network in East Asia that's a, a, a regional network to assess the air pollution and asset deposition. Uh, left side is uh, 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 asset deposition or uh, dry deposition monitoring, monitoring sites map. And the right side is uh, uh, ecosystem uh, such as uh, uh, inland aquatic uh, uh, soil and vegetation, like catchment scaled monitoring sites. So uh, this is uh, uh, monitoring sites all, all over the East Asia. So, uh, so I'd like to report that uh, uh, in the last year, uh, intergovernmental meeting of ENET decided the expansion of scope of ENET. Uh, this is uh, the very summary of the expansion of the scope of ENET. Uh, the left side, you see that uh, uh, air pollutants from SO2, NOx, ammonia, PM, uh, professional chemistry, uh, surface ozone, CO, VOCs, that are listed uh, according to that uh, uh, range of the activities. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Bart introduced that the uh, ENET, uh, ENET new uh, uh, cut, uh, activities such as the INET project cycle and procedures of its approval. This is a project cycle of the INET project uh, from one preparation stage, uh, preparation stage, uh, two approval stage, and three implementation stage, and four completion stage. This cycle uh, is the uh, uh, process to establish the project of ENET uh, for each, each year. Uh, this, this cycle, uh, this new mechanism uh, make it uh, possible to raise, to establish uh, the uh, project very effectively and uh, uh, flexibility uh, using the uh, main possible out, uh, outsource. Uh, this is the multi effect, uh, multi pollutant plus climate change. Uh, this figure is very similar, uh, very uh, familiar to, to explain the multi pollutants uh, from SO2, NOx, ammonia, VOCs. But uh, uh, recently, uh, this is very well known the GHG, greenhouse gases, uh, especially uh, in relation to the air pollutants. Uh, short lived climate forces is uh, focused uh, in terms of the climate change, uh, like that. So, uh, this is uh, the uh, uh, limiting climate change and improving air quality. These figures uh, links between actions aiming to limit climate change and actions to improve air quality. Greenhouse gases and aerosols, this is the orange and blue colors, uh, can affect directly climate. Air pollutants can affect the human health, ecosystem, and climate. All these compounds have common sources and sometimes interact with each other 
in the atmosphere, which makes it impossible to consider them separately. But uh, this category uh, is a uh, 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 scope of inet, just air pollution. But uh, as, we, as, we, as I mentioned, uh, this uh, SLCP, short lived climate forces, uh, and air pollutants are closely related in the atmosphere, atmospheric uh, uh, condition. So uh, this is the ENET project in 2022 and uh, 2023. Uh, this 2023 uh, eight project were uh, already decided by intergovernmental meeting last year. Uh, this category is, uh, this project are categorized uh, mainly the monitoring, assessment, research, capacity building, public awareness, exchange information. Uh, so this, uh, these uh, projects are related uh, from this year to next year, like, like this. So uh, this, this workshop is uh, the, uh, uh, one of this, uh, this year's uh, workshop uh, activities, like... Uh, here, uh, learning opportunities of ESR study of, on urban and rural relations. Uh, so uh, the next year, uh, there are eight, uh, eight uh, projects uh, other than the core activities of ENET. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the figures of integrated approach of atmospheric management. Uh, this is the emission of air pollutants and the transport uh, with chemical reaction. And uh, uh, this is a uh, uh, deposition or uh, <clears throat> uh, deposition on atmospheric or uh, an, uh, exposure to human health or some uh, uh, animals. So uh, in a uh, research study, this is uh, uh, emission uh, was estimated by em emission inventory and the transport chemical reaction by uh, simulated by chemical transport model and the concentration or deposition or health effects on health ecosystem uh, were uh, monitored. Uh, so uh, this uh, monitoring uh, results will be assess, assess, assessed and uh, uh, but uh, uh, this assessment uh, will be uh, evaluated by uh, the integrated assessment tool compared to the reduction uh, with cost uh, estimations here. This is uh, the integrated assessment model uh, uh, to, uh, to consider the cost benefit or cost efficiency uh, cost effective analysis. And uh, uh, based on this assessment, the uh, regulation or fiscal approach can be settled. Uh, and also, uh, uh, control technology should be selected uh, based on this information. So, this cycle, uh, <laughs> very shortly, but this cycle uh, is uh, the very uh, integrated approach to atmospheric management. Uh, so uh, looking at the uh, activities next year, first, second, third, fourth, six, seven. Uh, this, uh, these uh, activities are plotted uh, 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 regarding the, the category of the, uh, this uh, integrated approaches process. So, uh, we see that uh, this chemical transplant model, uh, model uh, should be more uh, enhanced or focused, I think. This is, uh, <clears throat> so uh, last, last year, the uh, intergovernmental meeting uh, 24th IG decided to establish the uh, three new task forces under the Scientific Advisory Committee, SAC. 
uh, this uh, new uh, task forces are re uh, reorganized from the uh, old uh, car four uh, task forces uh, until last year. So uh, task force of monitoring and assessment of atmospheric environment, task force of monitoring and assessment of environment effects, task force on atmospheric environmental quality management. This, this, these are the three new task forces. So uh, the uh, red color is main TOR uh, of each task force, but especially the task force of monitoring and assessment of environmental effects, ecosystem impact and human health, and the future direction of the E-net on environmental effects, uh, uh, including uh, in the uh, TOR. Uh, also, uh, the third uh, task force is the <clears throat> Uh, future atmospheric environmental management and also the benefit co control approaches for AI environmental and climate change and clean air technology. Uh, these uh, uh, key words are uh, uh, included in this task force. But we are now uh, preparing uh, to start each task force uh, right, right now. So pr probably next year, these task forces uh, will start its activities. So uh, this is the uh, end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, Dr. Yam showed uh, recent dramatic changes of the ENET, uh, expansions of the, of the scope, introduction of project mechanism, and establishing new task forces. And uh, integrated approach of atmospheric management slides uh, mapping is important to consider and seek a possibility of collaboration with international organizations, projects, and ENET project activities shown in the slides for utilization and development of modeling research. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yamashita. Uh, now we move on to the second presentation. Uh, we would like to invite Dr. Spignu Clement a research group leader and principal research scholar pollution management research group, uh, energy climate and environment program, uh, EASA, Australia. The floor is yours, Dr. Clement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to share our uh, work that is supported by the uh, collaboration between EASA and MOEJ. I, um, would like to uh, tell you about work that involves many different institutions and goes actually beyond the urban and rural air pollution interaction in, in Asia and connects also to some of the further presentations, both in this session as well as in, in the second session of the meeting. Let me start with um, a slide that many of you no, and uh, it actually have triggered a lot of discussion and strengthened some of the discussion about co-benefits and multiple benefits and strong interactions between the uh, climate change policies, air quality policies, and development policies. This has been a collaborative effort involving many institutions uh, in Asia and, and also Europe and the United States. And this is, this is really a, a good example of uh, highlighting the coordinated air quality, climate and development policy interactions that are reflected here in this chart in order to mitigate uh, exposure to PM 2.5. You see this summary slide that appeared in this, this report on air pollution in Asia and the Pacific, that in order to reduce PM 2.5 uh, concentrations across Asia, many different policies and measures have to be introduced. This is obvious, but the study highlighted the importance and the benefits of this coordinated action. As you see here, the changes in greenhouse gases, short-lived climate pollutants, black carbon here represents a whole range of uh, air pollutants as well as short-lived climate um, forces, addresses a number of SDGs, as well as reduces eventually uh, greenhouse gases emissions. 
and cuts across many different areas of policies. This study highlighted also a need. This was a regional study and highlighted results at the Asian level with some indications of differences across uh, Asia in different regions of Asia, but it also highlighted the need to further explore and understand better the national and local measures in action, to look into uh, fine scale urban rural interactions and in, including also uh, cross national uh, inter interactions and also to include more diverse representation of various climate policies and, and other policies. In other words, bring in many more scenarios that are produced locally, internationally within a region, or even downscale some of the global scenarios and see how the long terms associated with climate goals, the long, long term goals associated with climate change could be also translated into some of the near term immediate policies. And finally, and you will, you will hear about that in some of the further presentation uh, from, from my colleague in the second session. And finally also add better or represent better some of the social and governance dimensions in the study in order to deliver better on the science policy interface in a sense of bringing really these results even closer to science and make them actionable. As one of the steps of the first step in, in this discussion was initiation of the, of the study that's supported by MOEJ uh, to, to understand better these interactions between urban and rural air pollution. By now, it's not a mystery that many of the cities, a lot of pollution in the cities is originating from outside of the cities. And traditionally cities have been fighting their pollution mostly with local policies and relying on, on delivering on national policies. While very often, and this study has also an, an extension of the, of the GAINS model, have allowed to identify and visualize the implications of collaboration with very close neighbors in terms of uh, regions surrounding the city, where some of the sources that are not present in the city but are contributing to the pollution in the city are very important to control simultaneously. And vice versa, also emissions from the city have implications on, on rural emissions, and therefore this collaboration is very important. It allows also to highlight a number of, uh, of the benefits, multiple benefits of this coordinated action. And it will be explored later also uh, in further presentations how important that is to achieve a number of SDGs. As I mentioned already before, the study continues to develop and, and include a number of partners. And there are several opportunities to work further and improve several elements of the model. Let me reflect for a second on and remind you and ourselves about the tool <clears throat> that was used in this analysis. That's the GAINS model. I'm not going to go into details of the model itself. The model quantifies sectoral emission um, control potentials and costs. The diagram reminds a little bit of what you have seen from um, Yamashita-san just a few minutes ago when he was referring to the, to the um, integrated approach to atmospheric management uh, in his slides. Uh, this is very similar. Utilization of different exogenous activity projections and then consideration of physical and economic interactions between pollutants through implementation of the atmospheric dispersion models and comparison with the, with the data on, on, on health and ecosystems allows to validate to what extent or compare at least the, um, the model results and assessment of measurement um, with policy targets, as well as define further policy targets. The model includes 
a lot of data that has accumulated over time and has been an effect also of coordinated projects across Asia since decades and collaboration with many partners who are actually sitting and I hope also listening to the to these presentations beyond um, from all over Asia. Now I would like to highlight only that we, in terms of representation of measures and sources, we cover in the GAINS model known emission sources of both greenhouse gases and air pollutants and include characteristics of technologies. There are several hundreds of them, in, if not thousands, that include explicit implementation uh, information about reduction efficiencies of this measure, the costs, lifetime, co-control that's very important, that measures actually deliver on greenhouse gases, air pollutants, and some of them are also short-lived climate forces. There are also descriptions of application limits in order to make the model more realistic and, this, and, and show how over time penetration of different measures can increase. And the model includes a direct assessment of health and ecosystem impacts. This is actually nicely connecting also to several slides that Yamashita-san just shown and, and also some of the new studies that include uh, uh, impact on ecosystems. I think this offers a potential for um, further work and collaboration closely with the EANET where some of these aspects and the number of studies listed on previous slides actually serve, uh, could serve as, um, as a platform for collaboration. The model has been extended uh, in, in the course of the study and includes beyond the rather course of so 0.5 degree um, source receptor relationships for, prime, for, the, for the precursors of particulate matter. It included for primary PM 2.5, very fine resolution um, analysis of also monthly results for different sources, including also the vertical distribution of them, allowing to better represent the local interaction. First of all, understand better impact of local and regional sources on concentrations of PM 2.5 and then design the policies. The model was also extended to include better information about uh, or better links to many different models, both regional and, and global. And that allows to, to use uh, a, a large range of different scenarios developed in the region. But not everything is perfect, of course, and we continue working on improving the model. Again, a number of elements that are listed here, which are, can be represented better or are poorly represented currently in the model, include implementation barriers. When the policies are designed in a the model, they need to be uh, better represented in terms of uh, descriptions of how quickly they can be implemented. This is one of the things that actually has been hampering fast progress of introduction of the knowledge that we know uh, about measures and their benefits. Non-technical measures, cost of inaction, that's another area that is, has been discussion about cost of inaction has been strengthening and the model, we've been doing some efforts to extend also the model in that direction. To give you just a very quick example, the extensions in the GAINS model allow to better understand the source contribution. I just show here three maps showing how different distribution of these different sources or impact on concentration of PM is. While this is not a secret to those who perform atmospheric modeling, it is important to have the ability to quantify that and improve the validation of these results. You see that the rural and urban uh, cooking and heating sources are very different implications, local contributions, as well as an example of international shipping. We have many more layers of that information in the model, like power plants, industry, uh, agriculture, all of them have their own uh, pattern in a way of contributing to pollution. And we we can distinguish now better between the primary and secondary uh, pollutant contribution at different scales. 
Let me show you an example of this source apportionment um, for China and then also very quickly for Korea. This, we refer to this slides a waterfall uh, chart because it shows contribution from long range, regional and national sources as well as local and distinguishes also the, the contribution from primary and secondary pollution as well as different sectors. The, the estimate here is shown for 2020, the measurements from 2013 to 2016, showing a continuous decline in concentrations and a very strong contribution from local sources at this particular location. The current policies in a longer term would deliver and allow to reach the national standard, keep stay within the national standard addressing, this is residential sector, addressing household pollution, for example, uh, moving away from solid fuel use. And in the longer term, there's still some potential implementing further measures. The MFR refers to maximum feasible reduction, but would include some of the sources locally like waste and agriculture. The green is very important from the, uh, for agriculture becomes much more important and often it is a bit of a forgotten source. A very quick snapshot without going through each of them for uh, Korea, where there's been also progress in reducing uh, concentration, of course, but you see that the current policies without strong collaboration with other regions and also internationally would not be able to deliver large improvements and only in the longer term involving um, many countries around in the region would allow significantly to bring down the concentrations. Let me show you an example where uh, il that illustrates the connection between different policies. This is an assessment for the ASEAN countries that similarly to the Asian assessment brings in the key measures that deliver have a potential, the light yellow color here, indicates further potential be below policies that are recently implemented. You see also that the implemented policies are extremely important in terms of delivering on PM 2.5 concentration reduction, but there's still a large potential for many of these measures. I will not go through the details of the measures now, but wanted to highlight the interactions across policy and link to the, the circulating and ecological sphere and different components indicated in here. Now, this is a very busy slide, but it shows with the colors, I try to highlight how many, some of these policies actually cut across many of these elements like renewable energy, circular economy, biodiversity, and of course, urban rural. You see here on the left side, the gray color indicates this urban rural interactions. Let me Illustrate it in a different way. This is a little bit colorful slide, but it indicates for each of these measures, like here, clean cooking and heating, how many different aspects, many SDGs are addressed and also the, the elements of this ecological sphere. Now, for each of the measures, you see that this will trigger, trigger or imply different impacts and will move us on for different SDGs and, and, uh, and here involve also different um, policy arenas. And if we plot most of these measures that include transport, that's industry and power sector, transportation, including end of pipe measures and electrification of vehicles, eliminating high emitters, um, that is mostly air quality measure, but because of short lived climate forces as also a climate component and the city component, of course, delivering on the, on the SDG 11, 13, apart from health three that cuts in across all these measures. Then agriculture for livestock and fertilizer application, dietary changes. Then we have waste sector, open burning. These are not all measures that, I, that we identified in the study. But what is important on this busy slide to see is that there's a lot of interactions, a lot of similarities in terms of which uh, areas are addressed by them. And this is very important for the design of the policy and communication of the benefits. It's also apart from health that you see indicated everywhere on each of the slides, cities that appear in many of these 
measures. There, there are also very important um, linkages on institutions. You see here SDG 16 that is appearing in several places, as well as climate, obviously, SDG 13 that appears everywhere due to co-benefits. There is also partnership and the regional aspect, SDG 17, that I would like to highlight that is extremely important. Same is true here, where there's a lot of uh, common elements that are being achieved everywhere. Let me briefly address one other aspect that has been analyzed and now the developed methodology allows to better visualize. For different measures that you've seen in the previous slides, I show here an example for two countries in, in South Asia, where the contribution of the action locally, that's the dark blue, and the benefits of collaborating with other countries and contribution of other countries is differently important, but important uh, for each of these measures or nearly for each of these measures. This is something that is not often easy to share, but it's an important part of the discussion that should be part of the discussion, bringing in different uh, partners along to the table to discuss the opportunities. And the currently developed model allows to better quantify that and visualize to stimulate that discussion. Now, the last aspect I would like, like to bring is the co-benefits of measures for greenhouse gases. And here's an example from Cambodia. On this slide, you see that introduction of these measures that are illustrated by different colors reduce concentration of PM2.5 along this scale and greenhouse gases. You see that some of the measures might have near-term penalties of these benefits even, but in the longer term, they will move, and I will just flip here, Opala, I'm sorry, I wanted to flip forth and back. Between them, you see that in the long term, they move along the scale further improving the PM2.5 or reducing further PM2.5, but many of them significantly move in the longer scale to reduce greenhouse gases. This is an important aspect when discussing the short-term and long-term um, measures or the importance of near-term policy from the long-term perspective. There is a strong connection between the two. Let me summarize a few of the thoughts uh, from this presentation and also connecting a hope to some of the further presentations. We have developed tools and that allow to better assess the interactions between urban and rural air pollution, design and evaluate packages of measures that harvest multiple benefits of coordinated action. And these tools can support further discussion to develop such policies that address both near-term and long-term planning. As has been mentioned in introductory words to this meeting, there's been multiple studies that address this issue and has de have demonstrated actually that the policies, um, several measures have beneficial policies. The problem is implementation have been rather slow and not often not well coordinated. But there is a, there's a development of new methods and they address a, a lot of aspects that are important to strengthen this science policy interaction and improve the pace at which measures are implemented. And they include barriers for implementation and ways to overcome them. And, and this is something that um, Eric Tusman will be presenting uh, in the next talk. And there's strong interest from our side to continue working together with IGES on that and, and including that in a more explicit way in our model. Cost of inaction, uh, work that is also supported by UNEP and that fit very nicely as an extension of our approaches to add to the quantification. So to summarize all of these improvements that are being developed and could be further included in the model could be very valuable to allow for more robust and realistic models and more efficient science policy dialogue. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation, Dr. Klimunt. 
Uh, Dr. Clement showed uh, interactions between urban and rural air pollution in Asia and uh, MOEJ and EAS uh, collaborative research activity. Uh, the slides for PM2.5 source of point uh, apportionment in China and Korea show the future uh, prediction in 2050. Uh, we have to consider the next actions to achieve uh, clean air. And the proposed solution, the final slide, is uh, a more efficient science and policy dialogue uh, based on the development of integrated modeling analysis. And I believe that the ESA, IGES, and the ENET can play a major role in this perspective. Uh, thank you, Dr. Clement. Uh, now we move on to the uh, third presentation. Uh, we would like to invite uh, Dr. Eric Zassman, a uh, research leader, uh, Integrated Sustainability Center, IGES Japan. The floor is yours, Dr. Zassman. Okay, thank you uh, very much, uh, Fukunaga-san, and uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, uh, Ken and, and Zig. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, to be part of this uh, panel, and uh, I'm happy to prevent, present on behalf of uh, many colleagues uh, here, um, including myself, uh, Kaoru Akahoshi at IGES, and uh, uh, as well as colleagues from uh, YASA and uh, many other institutes uh, throughout Asia. Um, the title of my presentation is The Feasibility of Clean Air and uh, Climate Solutions, and I'll pay a lot of attention to this case of Thailand um, as a way to illustrate an approach that, uh, as uh, Zig mentioned, uh, will bring some of these uh, barriers and feasibility assessments more explicitly into integrated assessment modeling. Uh, but as a way to uh, start off, uh, let me highlight uh, some uh, findings that uh, Zig uh, also underlined in his uh, presentation. Uh, this comes from a report that will be released in April of 2023. Um, it's a report on clean air and climate solutions in Southeast Asia and uh, follows up on a previous uh, Asian assessment report that uh, Zig also underlined. Um, and it basically highlights 15 different types of solutions that would lead to uh, major improvements uh, in air quality in Southeast Asia. Um, and uh, also uh, bring uh, clean air to approximately 500 million people in the region. Um, and uh, one of the things I wanna underline here is some of the key solutions as uh, Bert also mentioned at the very top, you know, focus on open burning, transportation, also residential energy or what's otherwise known as clean cooking. And the, the good news about this uh, report is it not only highlights some of the potential for significant gains in terms of uh, air quality, health, but also in terms of climate change. Um, some additional good news is there are some solutions out there that are already being implemented in many of the areas that have huge benefits. So this includes uh, clean cooking. So we see examples, for instance, in countries like Cambodia, uh, where they've set up um, uh, very nicely developed uh, community-based uh, clean cooking programs. We've actually participated in projects where we've worked with uh, uh, women's organizations in, for instance, uh, countries like Laos to help uh, manufacture some of these clean cook stoves. Another area is transportation. Um, and Zig mentioned one of the keys to transportation and reducing transport emissions uh, is inspection and maintenance programs. And I think there's huge opportunities here for sharing between countries in Southeast Asia and especially Japan. Uh, Japan has very good experience with inspection and maintenance programs. And uh, several uh, years ago, I mean, the uh, governor of Tokyo has part of uh, this uh, diesel program uh, also introduced uh, nice reforms that I think could be shared and, and spread in uh, other parts of Asia. And then uh, last but not least is this uh, biomass uh, burning issue, uh, open burning of uh, fields, uh, which unfortunately in some cases has accelerated with uh, growing demands for uh, turning over crops. But here again, there are also some solutions out there. Uh, one of the solutions that is being promoted actively by one of our collaborators, uh, Dr. Spot, um, involves a more circular economy approach where some of this uh, leftover biomass would be used um, for energy applications, also for, for instance, uh, furniture or manufacturing. So there's a lot of good solutions out there, and a lot of these solutions I have been tested and, and applied, um, and I think could be scaled up and accelerated. Um, but one of the key questions moving forward is how can we increase the speed and scale of implementation. Now, I'm coming at this uh, from a social science perspective. I'm trained as a political scientist, 
And um, I mean, one of the things that we're taught almost from the get-go is policy on paper doesn't necessarily match action on the ground. There are what we sometimes call persistent implementation gaps that prevent us from realizing what we can uh, look at in a model. So how do we move things forward more quickly so that we can square the results of the modeling uh, with what we actually want to achieve you know, in terms of some of these great benefits? And what I would argue here is one of the key things, and I'm going to go back to the presentation by my colleague Ken Yamashita, is that uh, to look at you know that framework or that flow diagram, and, and Zig also highlighted this too, in terms of integrated assessment modeling, and to add us an additional piece to this. So we have the integrated assessment modeling right here. We have our kind friend who's jumping off of the ramp, but I would assure you that uh, at least from this picture, the landing doesn't look so good. Um, and so how can we uh, get a smoother landing so we're actually getting some of the uh, results on the ground? And what I would argue is one of the things that we can do, especially from a social science perspective, is to bring in this idea of a feasibility assessment. Now, this idea of a feasibility assessment is not something that I've created uh, out of thin air. Uh, if you look, uh, for instance, in uh, the 1.5 degree IPCC report, and now the most recent sixth assessment report, feasibility is becoming more and more uh, featured. And there's been some good work done by colleagues, for instance, at YASA, looking at feasibility at a, at a relatively high level in some of the large scale scenarios. I'm going to look at it for uh, a little bit more uh, on the ground type of approach for a specific country, but with a framework that I think could also be more generalizable to other countries. Um, and so what uh, our colleagues have done is we've looked at how different dimensions of feasibility, economic, technical, social, and institutional feasibility, affect the timing and speed of different types of um, solutions, like solutions to open burning, like solutions to... Uh, transportation, like solutions to, or clean cooking solutions. We've put a lot of attention on the social institutional barriers because these are things that are not typically factored into our modeling frameworks. And then we've tried to convert feasibility into a language um, or in a way that that can also be um, more explicitly incorporated into the, some of the models like GAINS or in terms of uh, the work that's done largely in Japan, the A model, or some of the work that our colleagues done at the Stockholm Environment Institute, the LEAP model, so that these different issues can communicate more clearly with the models and demonstrate what some of the impacts of not including these feasibility issues are like and what some of the impacts are when we do include them. And to do this, to assess feasibility, and so again, we focus first on Thailand because we have a lot of connections there and we know a lot of uh, people who have worked closely with the government. Um, we did this uh, by taking a sort of a three-step approach. So first we did expert surveys with targeted questions about the effects of different types of uh, barriers, um, economic barriers, technological barriers, institutional barriers, and social barriers, and how they might influence the speed and diffusion of different solutions in transport, energy, um, and uh, uh, in terms of open burning. We also did a systematic literature review and then factored that into our calculations. Um, and then we combined these two, the expert surveys and the literature reviews to arrive at composite estimates of the size of different barriers. Now, let me just give a quick example of this. This is once again for Thailand. Um, and what we did by doing these surveys and then also looking at the literature and then combining the two is we estimated the size of different barriers over a 10 year period for clean cooking applications in Thailand. And what this chart is showing is the green and yellow are the social and institutional barriers. What you can see here is these barriers not only have a significant impact on slowing implementation, but in this case, they're greater than the technological and economic barriers, which are typically included in the modeling frameworks. So this is underlined not only that they're bigger, but that they should also perhaps be included in some of our modeling frameworks. And this takes a look at a bunch of other solutions, um, not only clean cooking, um, and on, uh, but also open burning, inspection and maintenance of vehicles, stronger emission standards, and e-vehicles. And what it highlights once again is for many of the solutions, the social institutional issues. Um, and so just to clarify here, when I say social institutional, I mean like the for social, I mean the acceptability of different technologies, the awareness of the benefits and the costs of those technologies, 
that's on the social side. For institutional, I'm talking about the coordination across different agencies, the capacity to actually implement some of these things, whether or not there's good incentives within the policies. That's how we're defining these things. These issues are, are typically greater in, in many of the cases. Um, one of the exceptions, of course, is e-vehicles, where the technological and economic barriers are more significant and stronger emission standards. And this would stand to reason. I mean, I think these solutions have a stronger technological edge to them. Um, and so one again, what we're arguing is we should try to incorporate these things more explicitly into our modeling frameworks. And this just gives you an example of us trying to do this. We're working with colleagues in the pollution control department within Thailand um, as part of a climate change and clean air coalition project where we try to incorporate some of these barriers into some of the targets and goals that have been set for 2030 for Thailand um, for three different areas. Once again, these are the same areas, transportation, uh, open burning and uh, clean cooking or residential energy. And what you can see from this graph right here is the baseline that is without any policies. Okay, so the emissions for this is PM 2.5 are pretty high, um, but uh, um, with effective implementation, I mean, those emissions can be reduced uh, to about one third of the size. But the problem is that we have these barriers. And so you can see with the barriers factored into this analysis, then you actually are getting maybe about half the gains that you would normally get. Um, and so this is really important to stress to policymakers. I mean, in some ways, this is a bit of a discouraging message, but what we wanna highlight is, um, it's discouraging only to the extent that policymakers don't consider what you need to do to overcome those barriers. And then I think this puts a more encouraging spin on things. Um, and this leads me to my next slide. And the next slide really starts to think about what does it cost to overcome some of these barriers? What do governments need to invest in terms of capacity building, in terms of strengthening coordination, in terms of awareness raising, um, in terms of social acceptability and contextualization of different types of approaches. And what we're seeing, we talk to policymakers in Thailand, what we're seeing, this is just the cook stove example, is in many cases, the investments for especially some of these small scale technologies in terms of overcoming some of the institutional and social barriers are not so great. So what this slide shows you right here is a business as usual situation, how much is being invested currently in cook stoves or clean cooking and then what it would cost additionally to come overcome some of those barriers. And we need to check these a little bit more, but this is some of our preliminary estimates. We're drawing a lot upon the literature on transaction costs here. And once again, I think by turning this into some costing information, this can also be factored more explicitly into some of the modeling frameworks. Okay, so let me conclude with a, a few key points and also sort of a way forward on ways that we would like to collaborate. So the first point I'd like to emphasize is that integrated assessment models of have helped us identify clean air and climate solutions. Um, and then the next thing I think is really to increase the speed and scale of implementation. And to do this, we really need to think about enabling reforms. Without them, the speed might be decreased by 67%, benefits likely to be 50% less. Um, by incorporating some of these feasibility issues, we can make our models more realistic and then also have a real focused discussion on some of the enabling reforms. So for instance, you know, EANET is supposed to be um, supporting capacity building and training for different countries. And by putting costs on some of these things, I think we can have a really nice discussion about what types of capacity building works, where the institutional strengthening would matter most. Um, I think that um, this is also going to help us look at some of the costs of enabling reforms, both, you know, for international support and domestically. And then to pull us away from this a little bit, but to some of the broader themes we're talking about as Zig highlighted, and I think we'll get into in the next session, these institutional issues especially are critically important the more that we start focusing on multiple sectors, multiple stakeholders, and working across different spatial dimensions, rural and urban. And so one of the things we are thinking moving forward is to try to conceive of how some of these feasibility issues might influence, for instance, working across climate change, biodiversity goals, health goals, um, and what types of institutional arrangements can be fit for purpose to help drive quick and um, successful and, and scalable implementation. And so we look forward, uh, colleagues at IGES and, and many of our collaborators, we look forward to working with YASA, EANET, uh, Kyoto University, and many other partners that are on this call um, to bring feasibility into modeling frameworks 
so that we can achieve the benefits that we all want for Asia and, and globally. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Eric Sam. Uh, assessing uh, institution, institutional and social feasibility to overcome barriers is important to increase the speed and scale of implementation. Uh, and uh, Eric Sam showed the example of Thailand. And this specific example is a good tip to seek the next step to cross boundary and cross sector solutions. Uh, thank you, Eric Sam. Uh, now we'd like to invite uh, Dr. Hajime Akimoto, uh, science advisor for Asia Center for Air Pollution Research, Japan, to make a comment based on the three presentations. The floor is yours, Akimoto Sensei. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, uh, <clears throat> now I retired many times and now uh, my former title is a science advisor of the ACAP. Uh, <clears throat> it's my great pleasure to give uh, <clears throat> the, the opportunities given for uh, <clears throat> presenting our comments on this uh, workshop. Okay. Uh, Next slide, please. Okay, so the, the one of the key words for this workshop is a coordinated actions, mitigation of air pollution and climate change. But uh, so among the so called CO2 and other SLCPs, um, methane is not included in this ENET, I understand. But uh, so the, the next uh, important greenhouse gas is ozone. And fortunately, ozone is included in ENET as a part of the uh, air pollutants and also as a climate forces. And then NOx and NMVOC are, of course, the, the, <clears throat> the precursor of the ozone. So uh, this, this is, uh, I, I would say, in, very important for ENET. The ozone is a keyword to link between the air pollution and the climate change. Next one, please. And uh, today's my comment is just to, to give us one practical uh, additional information or ad rather <laughs> advertisement of a handbook of air quality and climate change. I myself and uh, Dr. <coughs> Tanimoto at NIES are now acting as a co-editor, editor-in-chief of this handbook. This will be a publisher is of Springer. And I think it's uh, being published chapter by chapter and the whole chapter will be published in a couple of months, I think. This handbook is, consists of 10 sections and about five, five chapters or five articles per section. So altogether nearly 50 articles. And among them, the, the most important uh, sections which are related to this workshop is a section three, hemispherical, regional and local air quality. And the another one is section nine, mitigation technology, for air pollutants and radio forces. Next one, please. And uh, under the section three, hemispherical regional and local air pollutants, uh, air, air, local air quality, <clears throat> one article, one chapter, regional and urban air quality in mainland Southeast Asia countries, which covers the Cambodia, Laos, <coughs> Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam. This chapter is written by <clears throat> Dr. Kim, Kim, Kim Oon et al. And another one is a regional and the urban air quality in Southeast Asia maritime continent, which covers Philippines, Metro Manila, Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, and Indonesia, Jakarta. This is written by Maria Kambariza et al. Maria is, I think, uh, she's a scientist in Manila. Um, <clears throat> these uh, chapters are important for covering uh, Southeast Asia. Of course, we know very much about uh, China, Korea, and Japan, but in um, many Southeast Asian countries, the air quality issue is not necessarily integrated yet. So, uh, so uh, these two chapters uh, include the <laughs> air quality monitoring status of including the methane VOC 
ozone and PM2.5 about each of these uh, countries and uh, mega cities. And the source, sources of air pollution and uh, existing policy and air quality management and climate change. So the, for, for these South East Asian, Southeast Asian countries, uh, so, um, policy action <coughs> for <coughs> air quality management and climate change is described in these chapters. I think that would be useful for ENET. Next one, please. And another section of section nine, mitigation technology for air pollutants and relative forces. And uh, <clears throat> I think I will say the most important uh, ch chapter for ENET is an increase in energy efficiencies. Energy efficiency stands for energy consumption per <coughs> uh, increase uh, of uh, GDP. And this chapter is written by uh, Xian Chou and et al. by Xu Xiaowang. Those are the Tsinghua universities scientists in China. Um, this chapter includes the general overview of energy conversion in China. And for <coughs> discussion is separated for power sector, industrial sector, iron and steel sector, cement sector, building sector, and transportation sector. And describes on a technical description, energy saving potential, CO2 emission reduction and air pollution reductions. So <clears throat> it uh, gives a very good e example in China last 20 years, how the increase of the energy efficiencies have decreased CO2 emission or <clears throat> the air pollution reduction. And, and so this kind of <clears throat> Uh, consideration is applied to the other in, in countries. It's a very practical policy importance for, <clears throat> for each countries. Next one, oh, that's all. But... Ah, thank you, Akimoto Sensei. Uh, so, uh... Dr. Akimoto introduced the handbook of air quality and climate change, and uh, this gave us the clues to think about future development of activities. Uh, thank you so much. So uh, I'm sorry for my uh, poor time management, but uh, uh, QA would like to have the time at the end of this workshop. So from now, I'd like to take a five minutes break from now on. So we start at the uh, uh, in Japanese time, 2.47. So please come back in five minutes. Thank you. Okay, so now uh, let's start uh, session two. So welcome back. <laughs> so my name is Satoshi Kojima. I'm a program director of Kansai Research Center of IJS Japan. So the yeah so this session two exploring synergetic uh, uh, linkages among SDGs. So this session provides another good example of science policy interface with modeling analysis result from ongoing collaborative research projects between EASA and the Ministry of the Environment of Japan on synerg uh, synergies of achieving several SDGs uh, sustainable development goals. So in this session we have uh, three, three presentations and then followed by uh, oval comment. Uh, so, uh, so first, uh, I'd like to, first, I'd like to invite the uh, first uh, presenter. Oh, sorry, uh, Dr. Keiyuan Liehi, the program director and the principal research uh, research scholar, Energy, Climate, and Environment Program, EASA, Australia. Australia. So, uh, Keiyuan, floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Satoshi, for the for the kind introduction. It's a uh, a uh, real pleasure uh, to be here today and to have the opportunity to present uh, some of our ongoing uh, collaborative work. I will uh, share my slides. I hope you can. I hope oh, yes, can we can. See yeah, we can see, but uh, yes, now that's good. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, so um, 
uh, as already introduced, uh, uh, my presentation today will uh, focus on uh, impl implications, particularly of climate policies uh, for sustainable development goals. Um, my focus will be particularly on uh, some collaborative projects that we have now um, between uh, um, IGES, uh, NIES, YASA, but also within the broader framework of uh, uh, a collaborative activity that has been set up by the uh, Ministry of Environment. And uh, the uh, co-benefits that I will be focusing on are particularly the type of projects that we are doing here um, in the area of biodiversity and uh, and health and air pollution. And uh, my colleague Sik Klimot has already um, uh, um, yeah, introduced uh, some of the uh, more deeper work on air pollution. So I won't go actually so much uh, in, into the details of, 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 of that part of our work. The work at the ASA generally in this area is of course much broader than uh, what I'm going to present. So I have to really focus on uh, the joint and collaborative projects that we that we have here. So I'm now trying to switch. Ah, it works. Um, yeah, so, so, um, and, um, yeah, so there is this dual objective uh, between, um, at the one hand, uh, we have to reach uh, net zero uh, greenhouse gas emissions, which means that we have to fundamentally restructure um, uh, national uh, e um, uh, economies at the national scale and implement uh, rapid. Um, implement uh, measures that can rapidly uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And we have to do that also uh, within a framing uh, that allows us to, to stay within the, um, uh, at the one hand, within boundaries of sustainable development, which are defined by the different SDGs, but also which can help us and support uh, basically achieving uh, very key objectives that have been set out by the SDG. Uh, framework itself. And if you think about this framing, um, it is clear that uh, climate actions that we set within the economy have implications and feedbacks on all of the different SDGs. And uh, this can be either positive feedbacks by uh, enhancing our ability to achieve the objectives of the SDGs, but this can also be trade-offs uh, uh, with uh, different types of SDGs uh, that need to be uh, managed so that we can achieve both objectives at the same time uh, without violating uh, important uh, um, um, objectives uh, because all of them uh, are, uh, are, are important to uh, basically maintain sustainability on the environment side, economic side, but also on the social side. Um, and uh, from earlier work, uh, we uh, do uh, understand that, uh, particularly if you think about how um, climate mitigation would be introduced globally, and if we uh, try to achieve um, very stringent climate objectives, like, for example, the one and a half degree uh, target, uh, this picture shows you uh, across uh, various different uh, modeling frameworks, uh, uh, integrated assessment models, uh, what they can tell us about uh, possible implications for different SDGs. The co-benefits, the positive side effects are colored according to the different SDGs and are and shown here on the top side. Uh, and then there are also uh, some risks and, and trade-offs that might uh, occur because of uh, climate policy, and particularly because of introducing uh, climate mitigation. And these are these are in the areas of, for example, biodiversity loss or risk of hunger, which are both due to the fact that at the one hand, we can expand, for example, uh, bioenergy use, which requires land. And if you do that uh, without consideration of the SDGs, this might compromise uh, uh, biodiversity. Uh, but also lead to competition with food uh, and uh, increase uh, the risk uh, of hunger. So this needs to be done in a way that we can achieve both objectives together. Other important trade-offs might include, for example, mineral resources. And then there are a number of important, uh, consistent and robust uh, um, uh, positive co-benefits. I will go less into this area to get today. Uh, Zeke has already mentioned health and uh, uh, but there are also, of course, benefits for, for other environmental objectives, particularly for water and other human uh, toxicity uh, issues. Um, 
these uh, trade-offs and how they emerge are actually quite different across different regions in the world. Uh, we see particularly in South Asia or in, in East Asia, China and India, here's two examples uh, where uh, we see uh, actually compared to the, to the aggregated uh, numbers at the global scale, uh, much higher potentials for, for, for benefits uh, and uh, lower risks for, uh, for trade-offs, which is, I think, uh, which is, I think, in general, a good news, but there is very little analysis that uh, really brings this picture together and looks at integrated analysis across both dimensions. And within this framework, we have uh, basically established uh, the collaborative project uh, under the umbrella of the uh, Ministry of Environment, uh, where we have four different um, activities basically uh, in phase one. You have heard some of the uh, results uh, on the health and co-benefit side of national and national climate policies by I seek earlier, and I will uh, introduce particularly uh, the activity which is ongoing at the moment in terms of the interactions with uh, biodiversity, uh, as well as um, an activity which uh, basically um, looks into uh, the benefits of climate mitigation in terms of uh, basically reducing climate impacts and to that also reducing the trade off with the SDGs. These are, this is multi-sectoral and looking into vulnerability and exposure. This is this, is this activity here. And you will see also uh, yet another presentation by Miho Kamai uh, from, uh, from IGES who has looked into detail into the country of Bhutan and the energy food water and health uh, nexus. Yeah, thinking on the air pollution side, uh, perhaps uh, very briefly, um, our uh, um, some of the some of the progress uh, there. Um, I think a very critical and important question is about uh, uh, to which extent uh, can uh, the air pollution um, impacts at the national scale be avoided also to local measures. And uh, Zeke has alluded very much in detail uh, on, uh, on, on, on strategies and sources of that mitigation. I'm showing here just one uh, uh, picture which compares uh, basically the reductions that can occur as a benefit of climate uh, mitigation within uh, these six countries, uh, and then compared to basically uh, further reductions that can be achieved in terms of air pollution from climate policies, which are transboundary, which are basically achieved in if other countries are more successful in terms of their uh, of the of the of the uh, of achieving their stringent climate goals or achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions. And what you can see here is that the situation across countries is quite different. Countries like India or uh, South Korea have uh, uh, higher benefits uh, and uh, basically the, the air pollution burden from outside is, is bigger uh, compared to countries like, for example, China, Japan, or, or perhaps uh, Thailand here, uh, which uh, they are uh, net zero uh, GHG emissions, uh, so basically climate policies show bigger local uh, benefits uh, uh, also within the countries, but but generally you have this combined strategy of uh, basically uh, co-benefits across different borders, and 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 they can be quite different uh, in Asia. And this is a uh, um, uh, these are um, relatively new results that we have um, um, that I wanted to report on on the air pollution side. Uh, but my main presentation will actually be on, on this update of the so-called Asian Climate Impacts and Vulnerability and Mitigation Dashboard. Um, we, we, the tentative title of this activity is the Asian Sustainable Development Explorer. Um, the objective is to uh, set up uh, an interactive and dedicated website with a, with a tool uh, where we look at a number of different sustainable development indicators for Asia. The focus is on both mitigation, uh, but also the avoided impacts, uh, and compare directly uh, reduced, uh, 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 basically reduced uh, climate change in terms of uh, avoided uh, temperature change, 
and illustrate trade-offs, but particularly also co-benefits for different SDG dimensions. And, um, and uh, to do that relatively holistically across uh, many different um, impacts. Uh, since the last time that I have been uh, showing this in the um, uh, to, to, to colleagues, um, uh, there has been particularly an, imp an update in the input data. We are now using CMIP6 climate data. There have also been additional indicators included, like uh, more extreme events, temperature, precipitation, uh, also air pollution co-benefits are now uh, it, uh, shown in the Explorer. And we are also moving towards uh, land and biodiversity indicators. And uh, the new online and customized interface is going to be, uh, the first version of it is going to be ready in February. And by the end of the year, we want to have a full-fledged uh, interactive uh, tool ready. Um, this is um, this is a, a, the first design of the entry page into the Asian uh, Sustainable Development Explorer, uh, where uh, you can, at the one hand, uh, basically uh, access interactive uh, maps uh, and to, where one can zoom into different countries, look at the spatial uh, exposure patterns, but then also uh, generate certain dashboards in terms of the vulnerability uh, and also the co-benefits of climate mitigation in different countries. And then in addition to the interactive side, there is also uh, the plan to have an increasing number of different stories in the Asian Sustainable Development Explorer. The first ones will be, of course, on, uh, on summarizing the insights that we gained uh, from the climate change mitigation and clean air uh, benefits, health benefits analysis that has been done, um, but then also to give an overview of uh, basically where climate action leads to the biggest uh, co-benefits across the SDGs in Asia and in different, uh, different countries. To give you a glimpse of uh, how uh, the Explorer will look like visually, so there will be a map like this, for example, which has different compound indicators where one could look into exposures across uh, different uh, temperature targets. So by moving the temperature, you will see where in Asia uh, exposure and vulnerability and co-benefits for different SDGs change. This will also be done across different socioeconomic futures. Uh, so the co-benefits of climate mitigation for, um, uh, for the SDGs will depend a lot on the socioeconomic development, how many people will be there in the future, but also um, in terms of uh, the economies, how does the vulnerability change into the future? And we are going to uh, we, are, we are implementing this across uh, three different um, SD, uh, sorry, three different socioeconomic pathways, the so-called shared socioeconomic pathways, SSP1, SSP2, and SSP3. Uh, um, yeah, so what indicators uh, will be particularly uh, added and updated? I mentioned that earlier, we have more information on extremes, um, and droughts, uh, but also heat waves, as well as uh, strong rainfalls. Um, then um, I would say something very important and innovative is not to only look into um, uh, temperature and heat stress and heat waves in terms, in terms of the heat itself, uh, but also to bring in humidity because humidity and temperature together um, uh, define stress at the end. This is rarely done in, in heat uh, wave analysis. And then, of course, we will have hydrology information and on water resources as an indicator for water scarcity. Um, we will look into the implications of climate change and cooling and heating demands on agricultural productivity, biodiversity, and air pollution, as I mentioned that earlier. Um, yeah, the stories I have said, I have told as well. So let me perhaps uh, move to the uh, next topic. Um, the next topic is perhaps a, 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 a brief update on. Uh, on the activity uh, where we want to look into, or we're looking into the um, uh, linkages between biodiversity and, and, and climate uh, and mitigation. And um, 
are basically combating climate. Here we are particularly interested in trade-offs and synergies and uh, how to find integrated strategies that basically uh, allow us to design uh, climate policies that uh, would also respect biodiversity boundaries. Uh, from um, research to, done together between IASA, NIS, and the, and the community, uh, we know uh, that it is uh, possible to uh, basically bend the curve of biodiversity loss. Uh, the last decades are um, uh, characterized by uh, rapid losses and rapid declines in biodiversity, which are mainly due to human development. And with, without specific conservation measures, uh, it is expected that our biodiversity of the planet is going to be reduced further and quite rapidly. Um, it is possible to uh, basically stabilize biodiversity losses by conservation efforts. These are definitely uh, key. Uh, however, in order to really be able to bend the curve and increase the biodiversity of the planet more, do we need also to switch our sustainable uh, production systems to become more sustainable, but also the consumption systems. And this is um, a, a number of different measures have been identified here from dietary shifts, including uh, reducing waste and including uh, increasing sustainability, uh, but also uh, tackling the issue of crop yields in the developing countries uh, in order to reduce land needs for agricultural production and uh, ecosystem services. Um, now, in this project, we want to understand how uh, basically uh, biodiversity protection and uh, climate protection can come together so that we are staying within biodiversity boundaries. And in order to do so, we have developed um, a research framework for, for Asia. The focus um, is, uh, is Asia. Uh, uh, key uh, people involved here is particularly uh, Shinichiro Fujimori, uh, and I'm building, actually, actually, this is a picture that he uh, put together uh, as an initial framing uh, for how we want to tackle uh, this joint integrated analysis of climate and biodiversity. Um, the starting point will be socioeconomic assumptions and policies, which are added into the integrated assessment models, uh, including stringent uh, climate policies. Um, and we are going to use uh, uh, the AIM tool by NIES, but also the message uh, global AIM tool by YASA, uh, derive land use scenarios, which are consistent with stringent climate policies, and look into uh, the implication of those land uses in ecosystem models, uh, particularly the AIM biodiversity model, and uh, uh, derive biodiversity indicators. So as a, as, as a first proxy, we'll understand how climate policies uh, can impact biodiversity. And then we are looking jointly also into uh, if we limit uh, basically biodiversity impacts um, and would take it as a strong constraint for climate mitigation, how does it impact uh, the uh, uh, economics of climate mitigation and the feasibility of targets if, if we want to achieve also very high standards of biodiversity. Uh, initial results uh, show that, um, uh, that basically uh, climate protection, so you get the, at the one hand, you get benefits from reducing the impacts for biodiversity, but at the other hand, you can create also trade-offs by increasing the land needed. Uh, for uh, climate neutral activity. And if we look at um, the implications, and this is work in progress about, about uh, how biodiversity and climate interact, um, and there is uh, basically, um, uh, there, there is a co-benefit, of course, of avoided uh, impacts of uh, climate change, which goes from the, from the gray area here to the blue area. Um, and, uh, but this is by far not uh, as, as large as uh, the, basically the increase in biodiversity uh, that we see across different indicators uh, when we have a, a real dedicated biodiversity policy. So the question is, how can we close this gap? And this is uh, what we are working on at the moment. This gap can actually be quite big uh, and, uh, and uh, can depend also on the different biodiversity metric that we are looking into. Uh, so these two figures uh, are actually for, this, for the same scenarios, but 
and look at the implications for biodiversity from using two different indicators and also across different models. Um, um, there might be some uncertainty and that's, uh, that's great that we look at the uh, Japanese integrated assessment model AIM and the YASA integrated assessment model Globium, uh, message Globium here. Um, and this is also where I want to stop. Thank you very much for, for your attention and I'm looking forward to any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, K1, for your uh, very insightful presentation. So your presentation uh, shows uh, like overall framework of collaborative research project between EASA and the Ministry of Environment Japan, and also that demonstrate like some like a like advantage of a modeling analysis to clearly visualize like, like a SDG linkage profile of the country specific uh, profile of the trade offs and synergies, and also like a uh, uh, like a how say the science based communication too like a dashboard and then also like a sustainable development uh, explorer. Thank you very much. Okay, so now uh, I'd like to invite uh, second speaker, uh, Dr. Shinichiro Fujimori, Associate Professor of Kyoto University, Japan. Uh, so Dr. Fujimori will focus on the biodiversity implication of land-based climate mitigation technologies. So uh, Fujimori-san, the uh, floor is yours. Right, uh, can you hear me? So we can hear you. All right, thank you. Um, good afternoon and good morning to you as a colleague. Um, my name is Shinichiro Fujimori, a uh, associate professor at Kyoto University. And uh, today's my talk is uh, focusing on our biodiversity implication, which has already been introduced by uh, Kaylan greatly. And then and, uh, uh, I'll uh, briefly talk about a joint research uh, with the ESA. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, my talk is divided into two. Uh, the, uh, let me uh, move on to the first one, uh, which is biodiversity assessment. And so this study is actually a, a almost uh, completed, uh, which are supposed to be submitted uh, maybe within this month, uh, entitled as implications of land-based uh, climate mitigation technologies for biodiversity uh, con conservations. And so um, uh, it's, well, uh, uh, I guess it's already a, a kind of a co uh, common sense, uh, you know, simultaneous achievement of climate change mitigation and biodiversity conservation has become a, a big challenge for human uh, to maintain a, a good quality of life, which was uh, also, I think, uh, mentioned in the previous COP. And, and drivers of climate change and biodiversity loss interact in a very complex ways. And uh, there should be, of course, the core beneficial measures for climate change mitigation and biodiversity conservation. But at the same time, there could be uh, some sort of trade-off as uh, Kayvon already uh, highlighted uh, in the previous presentations. And, you know, uh, to achieve the, uh, like, uh, uh, climate goals, uh, uh, particularly focusing on climate change, uh, the uh, negative emissions through the deployment of BECs and afforestation uh, is essential. Uh, that is uh, current uh, integrated assessment models uh, uh, measure commonly uh, implemented uh, negative emissions technologies. Uh, however, uh, it could induce you know, large scale bioenergy in implementations or uh, large scale uh, uh, afforestations, uh, which can change the situation for the local species. And uh, consequently, you know, uh, it can also uh, decrease uh, the biodiversity. And, and this is, yeah, uh, from the biodiversity community side, uh, it is also already uh, noted that, you know, uh, of course not uh, food uh, related land use is a major threat for biodiversity, but at the same time, energy here, biodiversity and uh, uh, bioenergy and BEX uh, is also highlighted here for the a, a, a one of the factor to uh, change the biodiversity. Now let me uh, give you a, a one of the illustrative uh, emissions profiles uh, to attain a 1.5 degree goal, uh, uh, which I I took from uh, IPCC special report on 1.5, and as you might uh, have already seen this picture, which is a a total global CO2 emissions. Uh, and uh, there is, uh, although there is a variation uh, of the emissions uh, trajectories, uh, uh, 
around mid-century, we should make an, uh, net zero conditions, and then uh, thereafter, uh, the negative emissions happening. And what is the source of negative emissions? And here we can see, you know, two major components where I also already mentioned uh, briefly, you know, or the, uh, one of them is FX, a bioenergy combined with uh, CCS, uh, and the other one is afforestation. And they have a certain amount of uh, uh, negative emissions here. And to some extent, we should consider uh, these large scale land-based emissions uh, measures would be needed. Uh, and maybe it could happen in, in the next uh, decade. And so we want to know uh, uh, how these two measures would uh, influence on the biodiversity. Which one would be more harmful for biodiversity? And so we set up a scenario uh, as shown in this table. Uh, we start from baseline, uh, which is uh, uh, without climate actions, uh, and we map a climate conditions uh, taken from SSPC 7.0, uh, which reaches around four degree a, a global temperature increase at the end of the century. And then we have three mitigation scenarios, uh, which uh, here, uh, maybe I should start from this, the, this bottom. Uh, full mitigation considers both BEX and afforestation, which would be, you know, uh, a kind of a conventional or uh, integrated assessment models or uh, scenarios. And so uh, this scenario uh, includes uh, both land-based uh, interventions uh, with uh, uh, around the two degree e climate target achievement. And then we have two very unique uh, scenarios where we only use the BEX for negative emissions or uh, afforestations. And so uh, these scenarios uh, can give us uh, that insight, uh, which measure uh, can be influential for biodiversity. And we again map the climate scenarios for these mitigation scenarios as, as RCP 2.6 uh, uh, equivalent uh, conditions. And we, we applied a, a integrated assessment model uh, named AIM, we started from AIM uh, hub, uh, which is computable general equilibrium model uh, uh, that generate a regional or land use change a, in consistent with uh, energy system. And then we have this kind of picture. Uh, for example, here we have a baseline uh, over this century and then a full mitigation, which uses uh, here orange energy crops at the same time as afforestation happen as well. When we look at the afforestation, uh, then uh, energy crops would not uh, invade uh, the land use, but at the same time, afforestation uh, becomes relatively larger than this uh, for mitigation. And then we feed this uh, aggregated uh, land information into AIM plan, which is a, a, a sort of downscale uh, land use model, uh, giving us a uh, half degree a global map, something like this. And then uh, finally, we have an AIM diver biodiversity model, uh, which projects you know, potential habitats of uh, over 8,000 species uh, by using a statistical relationships in the past uh, by incorporating you know, uh, human land use types and climate conditions. And we introduced here uh, two uh, major in indicators to assess the biodiversity condition. Um, one is uh, species richness. Uh, which can be computed this uh, uh, something like this. Well, uh, assuming that we have five species, only five species in a specific grid here, A, B, C, D, E, and assuming again, assuming that we have a on uh, in the future, we have additional two species under warming conditions, uh, which may be easy to be adapted uh, under the uh, warming world, uh, and A, B, C is distinct. And then we have uh, four species in the future, uh, while currently five species are existing. And then we have uh, like a 20% of the uh, uh, losses in species. This is a species richness calculation. And the other one is uh, biodiversity alterations, uh, uh, compositional or similarities. Again, as uh, uh, Suppose that we have uh, the same condition starting from five species and then uh, moving on to different species, but four species are existing. And then, you know, the 
but uh, species situations are different, although the number of losses are not so large. And we then uh, compute uh, the number of species occurred both in current and future, and total number of species uh, 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 denomination. And then uh, this indicator uh, can give us, you know, uh, the how the biodiversity has changed from current to future, not only considering the number of species. And the lower values mean more uh, progress of species replacement from current to future happen. And so let's move on to the actual results. Uh, so here we have the left-hand side, uh, species richness uh, uh, shown uh, over uh, this century. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, all scenarios uh, include the climate effect. Therefore, uh, the baseline scenario or uh, reddish uh, line it goes uh, de uh, declining trend. Uh, the land use change in the baseline scenario is not so uh, significant, but climate change is significantly uh, degrade the biodiversity conditions. And then we have a three a mitigation scenarios. Uh, they have small uh, variations in, in these uh, yellow, green, and blues. But at the top one, uh, which is the least biodiversity richness uh, scenario is a, a big scenario. It is because uh, the land use, the scale of the land use change is relatively small. You know, big bioenergy is relatively land productive uh, land-based uh, mitigation measures. Therefore, the amount of the land area uh, uh, invaded by mitigation measures is relatively small. But when we uh, rely on uh, afforestation, then the land productivity is not so large as energy crop. Therefore, uh, the, some areas are uh, you know, artificially uh, afforested, then biodiversity is worsening. The similar uh, trend can be seen in compositional similarity, which I, I will not go in details, but you know, overall impression is uh, kind of a similar situations. And we have a you know original uh, results based on that. Uh, here we have uh, left hand side Asian results, and the other regions are, are right hand side. Let me focus, uh, for example, taking a Japanese example, we have a baseline here uh, which shows uh, uh, significant losses in species richness. Uh, as I mentioned, it's mainly due to climate change. Uh, the warming world would be uh, stressful for all the current by the uh, ecosystem. And if we mitigate uh, the climate, uh, then uh, basically, you know, all scenarios in Japan show uh, relatively modest uh, losses in uh, species richness. But it, it's not always the case for other regions. And for example, here, uh, uh, East Asia, East South Asia, uh, where baseline and mitigation scenarios are not clearly different, which means, you know, mitigation uh, is not always beneficial for biodiversity. The land-based uh, measures would invade, you know, again, a energy crop may a change the land and uh, afforestation can change the land as well. And so eventually, it's really complex situation happen and mitigation, uh, uh, simple, naive land-based mitigation measure. Uh, it's, if such kind of mitigation measures happen, then the situation is quite, quite uh, complex. And so uh, here is my conclusion. Uh, the climate change mitigation uh, could reduce the risk of a future diversity loss on the global scale, regardless of land is change due to the implementation of BEX or afforestation. And climate change likely to have a greater impact on global biodiversity than land is change. So one thing is that uh, mitigation itself is okay. It is stabilizing the climate is, is uh, always beneficial for biodiversity, current biodiversity. However, uh, BEX and afforestation have a different implications on, on biodiversity. Therefore, uh, we need to be careful on how uh, which kind of uh, negative emission technology uh, should be implemented. Uh, maybe we may need some sort of you know regional uh, local considerations. Uh, in some cases, about uh, bioenergy would be more uh, better than uh, afforestation considering uh, biodiversity.
such kind of things needs to be considered. So let me briefly go to the second topic, which I hope uh, can finish uh, in uh, a few minutes. Uh, in our AIM group, we operate a uh, called AIM model, but we, we have several uh, components. And let me focus uh, just two models, uh, which is AIM uh, hub, uh, economy model, and energy system model, or named AIM technology. And we, we are now developing a, uh, a sort of a framework to interact these two models. But at the same time, uh, here, this energy system model, uh, Message IX, is the, uh, one of the greatest uh, model in the world as a energy system model. And therefore, we wonder whether we could uh, integrate our economy model with uh, message IX. And, and yeah, uh, both models have uh, in each the advantage and a disadvantage. So therefore, this uh, attempt is to com you know, uh, uh, complementary uh, activity to to you know uh, to uh, have a better modeling framework. I I won't go in detail, and and this uh, uh, model integration activity has an actually uh, quite mutual beneficial not only uh, our Japanese uh, group side but also ESA side side could also have a benefit. Uh, they can have an, a more rich representation in, for example, economic information, uh, which we usually use a uh, computer by general equilibrium model. And, and perhaps uh, generalization of this kind of procedure might open a new research frontier for this uh, integrated assessment community. Uh, more concretely speaking, uh, we did a, a model uh, uh, information exchanges between these two models, like, you know, first the message IX is run, then and have uh, provide a sectoral demand. And then again, uh, this kind of uh, information integration uh, has happened. And we, it's a really preliminary stage, uh, but I, uh, I give you an example of the results. And so here we have a primary energy under a uh, standalone model and message standalone model and the linked model. Uh, and uh, we are uh, finally uh, ended up with a sort of a convergent uh, uh, situations. And so, okay, uh, this uh, study has uh, carried out by uh, my student who participated in a YSP this year, which I think is uh, one of the great channels for us to make an, uh, collaborative research is between IASA uh, and Japanese organizations. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fujimori-san, for your uh, good uh, presentation. So your presentation highlights uh, the, the issue of this uh, uh, potential synergy trade-offs between uh, this climate uh, mitigation and uh, biodiversity issue with uh, some uh, technical issue of uh, evaluation of biodiversity issues. And then also, lastly, you uh, mentioned this uh, uh, YSSP, uh, the Young, uh, young uh, Scientist uh, Summer Program, uh, which is uh, organized by IASA, and then uh, so Japanese uh, student participated this year, and then uh, contribute to this uh, collaborative research. So this is very good news. Thank you very much. Okay, so now uh, I'd like to invite the third speaker, uh, Dr. Miho Kamei, a policy researcher, uh, Integrated Sustainability Center, IGS Japan. Uh, so Kamei-san, uh, floor is yours. Thank you so much, Kojima-san. Um, Hello, my name is Miho Kamei. I am a researcher of um, Integrated Sustainability Center of IGS. And I firstly appreciate such a great uh, opportunity I could present this work uh, with such great uh, members. So I would be very happy to be here today. Thank you so much. So I would like to start my presentation. I would like to talk about sustainable energy, food, water, and next solutions enhancing regional community-based supply chain system in Bhutan. This is uh, under MOJ as a project B and um, part of Bhutan component. So overview of Bhutan is Bhutan is seven hundred thousand quite small nations of um sorry um quite small um nation in the world and the current issue is urban rural population migrations um the people uh, rural area is into urban so this uh, led to the expansion of inequality. 
Then, uh, sorry. Bhutan's key challenges is last decades, a rapid urbanization, which changed the landscape quite much. And uh, Bhutan is now uh, investing quite large of infrastructures and the transmission line is uh, developed and this caused the degradation of forest and biodiversity loss and also increase of air pollution and waste increase. Um, in terms of PM 2.5 concentration, it is um, not quite serious under the uh, serious uh, levels, but the mostly the main pollution in Bhutan is increase of um, household level of air pollution, indoor pollution. Also, after COVID-19, access to basic needs and services is very uh, quite important issues in Bhutan. Previously, we developed the SSP scenario for Bhutan, and the SSP basic scenario, BAU, is going to the quite similar situation of many countries experienced, like um, majority people is moving to the large city and the large quantity is expanded quite much, and the uh, new infrastructure is coming, and the mostly the service is quite centralized. Compared to SSP2, uh, sustainability scenario SSP1 is more uh, local-oriented development and deployment of renewable energies and conserving the natural resources and biodiversity, also uh, local culture uh, heritage. So these are the assumptions. But before COVID-19, SSP2 is uh, in real society is quite uh, significantly happening. But after COVID-19, actually the 70%, more than 70% people are employed by the tourist sectors. So these people are uh, lost their jobs due to the COVID-19, so must go back to uh, sustainability, uh, must go back to their uh, local areas. So unexpectedly, uh, sustainability SSP1 trend is now happening in Bhutan. But this is a little bit positive phenomena um, because Bhutan people uh, recognize local food production is more important uh, recently. So they lack huge of uh, food availability during COVID-19. So Bhutan's government is now focusing on new policy is local agriculture production system and the supply chain system, increasing the um, infrastructure and the supply chain management systems. So these are happening now in Bhutan. For explaining SSP1 and SSP2 scenarios, I would like to uh, refer the built environment SSP scenario for Japan. This is also another collaboration with IASA. And we develop in parallel, we developed the SSP scenario for five scenario for Japan. And the, we developed the alternative SSP one scenario. One uh, nature-based solution is integrated into SSP one scenarios. And this is a little bit similar of uh, SSP one to, and SSP two of Bhutan's, but SSP one, uh, centralized scenarios and SSP1 decentralized scenario. These are the assumption of the scenario. So extremely centralized and extremely decentralized. I think the real world is something somewhere at the, uh, between SSP, these alternative scenarios. And the to Japanese development is currently relatively uh, centralized scenario and specifically like large scale city of Tokyo is more like the, having the system of centralized scenarios. So what is the difference is, is uh, Tokyo has already experienced quite huge development and all infrastructure has been uh, hugely developed in the context of national and then so now we are having the kind of shrinking phenomena of population, also infrastructures uh, becomes quite old. So the SSP2 scenario is BAU scenario in Japan is relatively a uh, little bit pessimistic. So we need some action to be uh, moving to the sustainable society in long term. But Bhutan is, hasn't had the, such development so far. So now they are moving to new development. Say they are going to different phase. So uh, even we are developing uh, application to same framework, but the, in the scenario is quite a different phase of the different development phase. 
So uh, based on the SSP one two scenarios, we are um, developing the key local structure plan, investigating how different SSP one and SSP two uh, development scenarios in locally. I don't have enough time to explain quite details, but this is uh, um, focusing on SSP one society energy, food, water nexus uh, context. As I said uh, the, before, Bhutan had the quite little bit centralized system for specifically food management system. They had a quite strong, big, a large scale market and pro food production cores, specifically only three areas in the countries. But now Bhutan is making, developing such a small scale, local oriented food production system and fridge system that is the supporting the infrastructure of new supply chain system of the food. And also such clean logistics, which can also support local oriented food supply chains. And as well as also uh, such um, irrigation system and also uh, mechanized small scale in locally oriented agriculture system. So also government um, making the new policy of um, electric vehicle deployment, as well as locally oriented renewable energies. So these new policy development of Bhutan is quite going to the SSP one decentralized locally oriented community level sustainable development strategies. So this is a uh, detail of energy flow of energy flow in national scales. So electricity in Bhutan is basically made by hydro, but in specifically building sector, huge biomass is used for buildings. This is causing um, quite huge of air pollution in the context of national. And this is the food flows of Bhutan. Um, currently, only 70% of domestic uh, production and 30% is imported from the mainly the India. This is why I think uh, Bhutan government is now enhancing the self-sufficiency self of food production in within the countries. This is a flow of water, only 1%. Uh, is going to domestic use. So water resource in Bhutan is quite sufficient. And, but even the so resource is quite sufficient. Um, some small cities uh, suffer from the water shortage and scarcity during a uh, dry season. This is because of the lack of quality of water infrastructure. This is the situation of building uh, of Bhutan's. Um, the, Mostly urban residential buildings is now becoming the quite highlights and the local buildings still have using the quite traditional materials like mud and bricks and the quality is quite a bit, little bit different so energy efficiency standard is also quite different so huge innovation is needed specifically for rural areas. So. Um, also, energy equipment, heating equipment in rural area is still using uh, wood and coal and LVT gas, such uh, all the types of fuel used for cooking and heating. That is the very typical in um, Bhutan and also Asian regions in rural areas. So these cause a huge amount of pollution and air health impacts. So the summary of SSP1 key transformation uh, is in energy system, its increase of on-site renewable energy is quite important. Also energy efficiency renovation for the old historical types of building specifically in rural areas and food systems. It's local oriented supply chain system and new infrastructure development supporting local sustainability, sustainable agriculture system and supply chain logistics system. These can be, uh, have to be uh, into consideration and the policy implementation is needed. And the water system is basically the water infrastructure in rural area and the piping system and adaptation for water scarcity and shortage during the um, dry season. These are the key challenges for key transformation to achieve the SSP1 scenarios. 
We investigated SSP1 Nexus Energy Food Board and Health Nexus with interlinked with NDCs. So I cannot explain quite details uh, today, um, but we just uh, quantit qualitatively uh, linked with what is the link and how um, we can make the transformation specifically differentiate urban and rural. Based on this uh, qualitative analysis, uh, now I'm working on the message IX specifically preliminary results. This was um, base, base scenarios. So residential sector is basically demand is uh, increasing with the increase of GDP growth. And the uh, window is actually for the capacity, window is not very feasible in Bhutan because of the high cost and steep mountainous context. And solar can be more installed in the housing rooftop. But we differentiate the urban and rural. This is the SSP2 uh, basic scenario for urban. It's urban is mostly electricity, electrified, and the heaters and cookers are relatively modern systems. And the urban system, hydro and solar are utilized mainly in such urban context. In rural, it's a little bit uh, difficult in SSP2 scenario because steel cookers and mainly filled by biomass wells, like uh, these traditional bio cookers. So these uh, increase the air pollution and the solar and the wind is relatively less uh, installed in the future in these scenarios. So this is the investigation gains model as actually have already the Bhutan scenarios. So I extracted the analysis data from the gains database. So investigated and this database can quite significantly linked with SSP1 transformation discussions. So uh, as the cookers and the biofuels is used for um, housing is quite uh, linked with air pollution, but CO2 does not count this pollution. But uh, this CO and VOC, CH4, count such uh, air pollution from biofuel use. If the installment deployment, huge deployment of renewable energy in locally uh, can have still strong potential to improve such CO, VOC, CH4, and also energy system is increased uh, improved with um, CO2 emissions, with instrument of renewable energy, such benefits. And also Bhutan's new policies of electric vehicle and the transportation um, in instrument deployment can improve such huge of the context of air pollution, the CO2, CO, VOC, um, SO2, and the NOx. These are uh, improved by the, this electric vehicle of uh, policies. But as Bhutan is now trying to increase the domestic and agriculture food production system, so maybe NH3 and N2O and CH4, these pollution may increase. So another uh, policy implementation and application for improving such like fertilizer improvement, these are uh, new improvement for different types of mitigation and the mitigation of air pollution is uh, very important in the future. Based on this uh, investigation, so we just developed the SSP1 preliminary results. So urban residential sector is urban population is, uh, SSP1 is modified. So also increase of building and energy efficiency, reduces energy demand and long term and the facilities and all electrified and so such uh, urban system is connected by the small scale microgrid. This can make the more efficiency. So electricity can be um, mainly by um, produced by hydro and solar. This is meet uh, with the demand with locally and this energy can yeah, produce locally. And the rural sector is also biomass cooker and the heating system will be replaced by modern systems. So increase of uh, renovation, quite well renovation housing also decreased the energy demand. And even energy demand is decreased, but um, locally oriented on-site renewable energy in, in increase. So capacity is quite high in 
rural areas as well. So um, ex such extra energy can be used for EV charge and at home and also community farm for sustainable agriculture. So these are currently uh, we have just done uh, SSP1 scenario so far. So from now on, I would like to make more uh, connection between other sectors and also pollution improvement with uh, improvement of the scenario analysis. So I this is a presentation of Bhutan. So I just have two extra scenario uh, presentation. This is a, a link with other project as and uh, also MOIJ. So this analytical framework development of collaboration with IASA is, I hope I can extend to other application. This is more policy implementation stage. We are uh, collaborating with Danone City for making the climate action plan on the ground. So this analytical framework is, uh, can be used, applied for this uh, quantitative roadmap making for real policy, policy implementation stage. And also this year, uh, I just, as I said, I just had the more discussion about the policy and SD policy and science interaction. And I organized the session with uh, Urban Climate Change Research Network and focus on climate change action and the regional sustainable development synergies. So Bhutan colleague talked about the Bhutan's key challenges and sustainable development. And this uh, global network, we can also extend our collaboration with science and the policy interaction. So, this uh, final my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kamei san, for your very uh, informative uh, presentation. So I think the your presentation highlights the importance of uh, like a narrative uh, scenario to like uh, as a background of uh, modeling analysis to provide very like a uh, uh, policy uh, uh, good policy implication, and then uh, this will facilitate science policy interface. Uh, I think this is a very important point. Thank you very much. Okay, so now uh, I, I'd like to have a uh, comment. So I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Michiko Kainuma, uh, research advisor, IGES Japan, uh, to uh, provide an overall uh, comment to this session's presentation. So uh, Kainuma-san, uh, floor is yours. Uh, thank you. So echoing, it's okay. Hello. Ah, uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much uh, for your uh, wonderful presentations. In research project B, we are tackling the problems of air and climate change from the linkage of SDGs such as bio biodiversity, energy, food, water, and health. EASA was published in nineteen seventy. 72, 50 years ago. And in this year, the Club of Rome published the limits to growth. The limits to growth issued a warning that within 100 years, the growth of the earth would reach its limits. Although the problem were raised, unfortunately, the fundamental problems has not yet been resolved. This year, 50 years later, the Club of Rome published the Earth for All. The Earth for All analyzed the relationship between the global economy and the planet's life support systems and proposes measures to change directions. Um, by the way, EASA translated this book and published last month. And Professor Johann Strom, Doc Strom, one of the authors of the Earth for All, also suggested a framework that consists of nine planetary boundaries in 2009 to ensure that the Earth remains livable for next generations. And in 2015, scientists concluded that human actions have breached the boundaries for climate biodiversity, forest, and biogeochemical cycles. And in 2022, this year, the fifth boundary, chemical pollutions, including plastics, have been crossed, and experts are exploring whether a sixth has been transgressed to a 
uh, proposed new category is fresh water. So fresh water also uh, becomes very, very important urgent matter. And the tipping point risk is now acute. So the impact of climate change policy on biodiversity is extremely important and urgent issue when considering the sustainable of our planet. And AR6 Working Group 3 also takes up biodiversity as a national development objective along with ecosystem service and food security. Millions of people of are currently enduring horrific air pollution in overcrowded cities need to be able to breathe clean air again as economic transport form. So I think this project shows the pathway to that. So we need to solve the problem of, of air pollution together with other problems such as climate change and biodiversity. From this point, Project B can provide support tools to analyze the nexus of climate change, biodiversity, and land system. And the quantitative analysis is essential in formulating policies. I believe that the pre presentations of new results on co-benefit for climate change, countermeasures, and air pollution, and health using the gains and aims model will greatly contribute to the promotion of policies in Asia. So I'm very much interested in the dashboard uh, that Dr. Rai he presented. This dashboard provides important information to policymakers and uh, scientists and uh, other stakeholders. Data is essential to explore Asia sustainable development and uh, and the data accounted all over the Asia is very, very valuable. So Professor Fujimori showed implication of land-based climate mitigation technologies for biodiversity conservation, showing four scenarios using 3M family models. The basis of climate change countermeasures is to reduce emissions. It is not easy to have negative emissions. He explained their impacts on and biodiversity in detail. And it is also important, I think, to pursue the demand side reduction to uh, reduce emissions uh, because the uh, negative emission is, um, I think it's really, really very, very difficult to achieve. Of course, people are trying to do that. And Dr. Kamei studied sustainable energy, food, water, and health nexus. Uh, solutions, enhancing regional community-based supply chain in Bhutan. Bhutan is the first country to become a carbon negative uh, country. So Bhutan is famous as also, also famous as a country pursuing uh, G and gross national happiness. And in Bhutan, there is also issue of urbanization. So it is a good sign that Bhutan thinks more local oriented strategies, including uh, local food production and on-site energy and food. Also COVID-19 uh, pandemic is a pity. And uh, Dr. Kamei uh, research is, is very useful in the sense that it provides useful information for urban and rural action plans. So the, the world is in a very unsuitable situation right now. It becomes more and more important to integrate various issues, including air pollution, energy, food, water, and land use. I understand that it is very difficult to find for solutions to in, integrate these issues, but for the us to be livable for human, it must be liable for other living things as well. So I'm sure this project contributes to find solutions to this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kainima Sensei, for your very valuable comments. And then uh, so it's very encouraging that uh, so you endorse the importance of this uh, collaborative project uh, to contribute to this uh, science policy interface. Thank you very much. So uh, about Q and A, so, so far we haven't have any uh, particular question. But so any time, uh, so please check the uh, say if you have any questions, please use a Q and A function. The, you can find the the Q and A uh, mark uh, below the this Zoom uh, box. 
And then, so before the, I say, having a break, so we'd like to have a group photo now. So uh, all speakers, like panelists and presenters of all sessions, could you uh, camera on for uh, taking screenshot? So please, uh, camera on, please. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good morning, uh, still in uh, in Austria. Hope everybody is doing well. And uh, we are going to uh, shortly uh, start uh, the last session. Uh, the last session is a panel discussion, which will uh, probe a little bit more into uh, what it means really to strengthen this uh, science policy interface. And uh, to strengthen the science policy interface, um, we've already heard, you know, a little bit from uh, different uh, researchers. Um, so we're going to bring in some folks that uh, actually work uh, at the uh, interface of science and policy and then bring back our colleagues from uh, YASA um, and uh, have a sort of open-ended discussion. Um, I really, really, really uh, want to encourage people to uh, raise uh, questions and answers, uh, or excuse me, questions, and hopefully we'll provide the answers uh, in the uh, Q&A box. Um, I think one of the key things that's uh, becoming increasingly clear, and this was suggested uh, by our colleague uh, Bert Fabian uh, earlier, is that the science policy interface is, is not just about science, scientists and policymakers working with each other, but it's also about uh, broader social groups. So it's, frequently we're talking more and more about the science policy and society. And uh, one of our key target audiences today is, you know, this broader general public. So please join in the discussion. I'm going to raise a few questions, but uh, hopefully we'll have a little time to also raise some of these questions uh, for our colleagues uh, here um, through the question and answer uh, box. So please, please, please uh, bring some, some of those points in to our discussion. Um, so without further ado, then I'd like to turn it over to uh, um, some of our colleagues who are here. Uh, to talk a little bit about the science policy interface. First, we're going to bring in um, one of our colleagues from uh, uh, Vietnam, uh, and uh, this is uh, Dr. Sao. Uh, Dr. Sao is uh, one of the representatives uh, who works closely with uh, EANET, um, and uh, he's going to um, talk a little bit to us about what are some of the keys in his mind to strengthening the interface between science and policy in Vietnam. And then I'll ask the same question to our colleague, Bert Fabian, more broadly about Asia before coming back to uh, Zig and k to hear about what uh, some of their uh, uh, views are on strengthening science policy interface. So first, I'd like to bring it over to our colleague, Dr. Sao. And uh, Dr. Sao, in, in the Vietnam context, in places where you've worked in, in Vietnam, what do you think are some of the keys to strengthening the uh, uh, interface between science and policy? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zuman, for your question. And first of all, uh, thank you very much, ICS and ACAP, for inviting us to this workshop. Uh, we think that this workshop, the uh, topics presented and the objectives and the concept is very good. Uh, it fits with a very pressing need in, uh, in countries, especially in developing countries like Vietnam now. So let's come uh, for your question about uh, what are the keys to uh, promote more uh, science and policy dialogue. Uh, first, in Vietnam, we think that uh, we need to promote uh, independent scientific research because uh, we need to find what are the solution for the for the lean time issues so that uh, we can provide with the policy maker what are the solution so that they can base on the the scientific evidence, uh, they can uh, follow it, uh, policies that could be effectively uh, solve the problem. So that is one of the key. And the second is that we think uh, multi-stakeholder dialogue and policy dialogue is very much needed. Uh, we need to bring to the table to solve an issue about the, from the private sector, from the government, and from the academia to see we need to pro uh, formulate as a what can I say, a systematic uh, approach to the problem. So that is uh, the second point uh, we would like to highlight. And the third is that uh, actually it is what we are working in doing in Vietnam is that uh, 
the state uh, government, I mean the uh, state management authorities, uh, they uh, every year or every two years they place orders uh, for scientific uh, community to uh, a list of uh, problems that lean time problems. So they uh, based on that the scientists uh, propose so a scientist scientific uh, solution, and they also create uh, like an independent uh, committee to e evaluate. Uh, the uh, proposal and also to evaluate the results so we can have more real time issues oriented uh, scientific uh, research. So that is a third point. And uh, we think that uh, uh, now we are living in a, like a, we need uh, some issues and global issues. So we think intergovernmental organization is also very important. Uh, let's say from our EA net uh, network, we, every year we have a IC intergovernmental meeting. So we think that with that Skype meeting, we can bring uh, a consensus for the regional issue from uh, that affect other countries. So that is a uh, third point, uh, that's the fourth point. And, and finally, we think that uh, in Vietnam, we also are going to promote uh, collaboration between the university, research institution, and the state uh, the authorities. Every year or every two years, we sit together to see uh, group of And uh, finally, we think that uh, we need to have a very independent, uh, like independent institution to assess and to study uh, what are the impacts of the policy and what are the results of the scientific research so that we can bring to a very ind independent uh, results to solve the problem. So that is uh, as a key that we think need to be done. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Sao. And I think, uh, you know, you really highlighted some key points that I think uh, come up a lot in the discussion of uh, science policy interface, you know, for instance, having a very objective uh, and independent uh, scientific inquiry in institutions is critical. At the same time, we want to set up a multi-stakeholder dialogue that will support a systemic approach to um, our research on different problems. And I think one of the key stakeholders that you underlined here is uh, especially the, the private sector. I think we're realizing more and more, yeah, exactly, that um, you know, we can come up with good scientific solutions, uh, but, um, you know, a lot of times the resources, you know, Bert raised this point at the very beginning, the finance, a lot of times, especially when we start scaling things up, has to come from the private sector. Yeah, please go ahead. Let me uh, shut up for a little bit. Go yes, ahead. actually, uh, in terms of uh, climate change mitigation and environmental protection, I myself in the past, we involved uh, with the private sectors and we come to talk with them and we do uh, do like a site survey or do the lean time situation. I think it would be pretty much different from what we think we sit down in the office waiting. Mm -hmm. So I, we think that uh, actually we propose some very good solution to private sector with the uh, integration or with the uh, engagement from them from the very beginning. So that is uh, my own experience. Mm -hmm. Experienced. Thank you. So the, I just want to highlight what you said here because I think it's critical, right? The bringing in the private sector early in the decision-making process and sort of, we call this sort of co-design sometimes. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, so they're part of the, the they have ownership. They have ownership from the very beginning. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But I, I also want to highlight a point you raised too, which I think is critical. Sometimes the policymakers and the scientists and, and the private sector, they might not all agree with each other, right? Uh, that's why uh, I think uh, uh, you made a very good point that uh, it is very often happens, I think, everywhere. So we need some kind of consultation uh, from time to time. That is uh, very important. Yeah. Yes. And I mean, if you don't mind me saying, I, you seem like a very uh, level-headed, uh, reasonable um, person, and maybe you might be good at making some of this consensus uh, between the different uh, stakeholders. Uh, actually, uh, I think for the private sector and for the government, uh, as a scientist or consultant, uh, we just uh, bring to them the very objective uh, uh, assessment. So I think, uh, and reasonable assessment uh, objectives, and I think they will accept our proposal. That is my own experience. So objectivity and independence at first is also very critical to make sure that what you're doing is justifiable and, and they'll, they'll buy into it, but need to get them in there early so that we can have a discussion about these things. Yes, yes. 
Good. Okay. All right. I mean, I, we're going to come back to you. So this is going to be an ongoing dialogue, but I'm going to go over to Bert now and, and we'll, we'll enrich our understanding. Then we'll go over to our colleagues in Yasa. Then we'll talk a little bit more about some of the support that could potentially come from EANET to help to work on these issues. So we'll, we'll come back yes, to yes. you. Yeah, okay. you're, you're, but I love your energy. It's really great. It's really great. Yeah. Okay. Let's go over to our, our co colleague, uh, Bert Fabian. And, and, and Bert, I mean, uh, you have a tremendous amount of experience, you know, working at the interface between uh, science and policy. I mean, to be uh, straightforward here, uh, Bert and I think we go back almost to 10 years or so. And I can remember many, many times where Bert is in the room and he's, I mean, he is right at the the edge of both of these issues. I mean, his his arms are quite long and he knows how to bring people together. So I, I want to hear from, from Bert's side a little bit about, you know, what he thinks are some of the keys to strengthening the science policy interface. We heard a little bit about Vietnam, but more generally on some of your experiences working in Asia, um, you know, you're in this EA net role, but you've had, you know, manifold experiences in, in, in working in city level and, and, and as well as country level. So, so Bert, over to you, what, what, what can you offer us in, on this, on this important question? Thank you very much, Eric. Dr. Kao, it's very nice to see you. I'm envious. It seems you are in the same room. <laughs> that is very good to see uh, both of you together, uh, definitely. Maybe some of my comments will be echoing Dr. Kao's, and uh, maybe I add a few more based on my experience. Uh, yeah, there's a lot to be said, but from what I observed, and uh, there are many instances Maybe I can uh, maybe start uh, some examples. Uh, if you recall, early 2000, Supreme Court ruling in uh, New Delhi on the implementation of CNG buses. If you recall, uh, more recently, I think last year in Indonesia, uh, stakeholder um, non-government uh, organizations sued the government of Jakarta to do more on air pollution. And recently here in Bangkok, in Thailand, uh, we also see similar uh, engagements wherein a strong uh, NGO or civil society sector is putting a lot of pressure to the government to implement more uh, government actions or policies. It is, uh, in a way, it mirrors the problem, which is right in front of us. Air pollution, you can see it, you can feel it, you can smell it it's every it's always there in front of you especially during winter time so people are fed up and they demand more action uh, in the civil society organizations you see more and more scientists supporting them in terms of getting the information across however there is some kind of friction because government is sometimes left uh, um, how do you say it like uh, caught off guard uh, they know the issue, they are looking at this issue, but then people want more action right now. And sometimes this process is not really fast in terms of government. And uh, in many cases, uh, people, citizens are fed up and they want more action, as I mentioned. But balancing this, as mentioned by Dr. Kao and yourself, Eric, uh, putting in place this multi-stakeholder uh, bodies or, or, or committees where in government, civil society, private sector are all in one room and can have this kind of dialogue and present science-based uh, information studies and then work with the government and private sector to implement or design uh, policies and measures to address the problems. I think that's the best way forward. But having said that, I also had in my mind, like it should be beyond the environment, like a whole of economy approach, which has been said already by many of the speakers. We have data that uh, includes impact on other sectors, not only on health ecosystems, uh, but also energy, uh, uh, sustainable consumption and production, other key areas. And sometimes when we organize this, we always, when I say we now, like in my past working with the NGOs uh, in UNEP, we always work with ministries of environment. And uh, in our meetings, we try to bring in ministries of transport, ministries of energy, but I think we should do more, like especially ministries of planning, ministries of uh, trade and industry, 
because many of the policies that are put in place could impact also those uh, other key uh, sectors. And this is where the problem lies sometimes. Like uh, sometimes decision makers will see or will think that policies and measures we implement to regulate air pollution or to reduce air pollution will impact the bus sector or will impact the, the farmers or there is no money in government to provide subsidies to farmers. So, but maybe if we have that, uh, kind of uh, strengthened uh, system in place, then it would be very beneficial. Dr. Kao also alluded to this intergovernmental initiative. And from what I have uh, also experienced, it is very helpful, especially for the countries who are in the early stages of development or like low, uh, low middle income countries, because they hear firsthand from the experience of the adv more advanced countries in terms of mitigation. Sure, they have spent a lot of money uh, to address the problem, uh, but the other countries will also learn from that kind of experience, like how they chose it, how they financed it. I always thought that there's no uh, lack of financing available out there. I'm sure the development banks, the ADBs, world banks will be more than happy to finance projects if it is designed in a feasible, sustainable way. And uh, I guess the intergovernmental bodies or initiatives, this is where this kind of information sharing can benefit each other. And maybe from uh, a last point from my side in terms of strengthening the science policy interface is to encourage more studies or actions, maybe more studies, connecting it with the universities, researchers working in the field. Air pollution is... You can say it's overstudied, impacts on health, but there are still many cases where uh, there's lack of information, like fugitive emissions, VOCs from uh, uh, gasoline stations, um, ozone, uh, development of ozone, higher NOx, higher number of gasoline vehicles, uh, higher NOx, higher ozone, how it impacts health and also how it impacts uh, climate change and also uh, ecosystems. There are still so many of this. Uh, and I think uh, if there is government effort, but also multilateral efforts to support more studies or research on this topic, again, linking to universities, linking to intergovernmental bodies, I think we can definitely strengthen these processes of the science policy interface. Thank you, Eric. Thanks a bunch, Bert. And uh, it's a real pleasure to hear from you on some of, you know, uh, what you view as some of the keys to strengthening this uh, interface. I mean, uh, ranging from, you know, going back to the CNG case uh, in New Delhi, which was a court case, which uh, uh, basically led to a, a major transformation in the transportation sector in India. And then uh, more recently, court cases in Jakarta, uh, in Indonesia, um, which I think have focused a lot on the right to clean air. Um, we also have some action, I think, from civil society in Thailand. They're pushing forward for a new Clean Air Act. Um, and so all of these things, I think, emphasize, you know, some of the societal elements and some of the institutional arrangements that can really channel some of the push from below for some of these things. Uh, my colleague, uh, So Young Lee, is here in the room with us, and she works a lot on just transitions. And I think this is another area which, you know, can help channel some of the, the push from below for some of the change that we need within. Um, also, I think, you know, the point that you raised about uh, sort of working across multiple different stakeholders and multiple different sectors, bringing in transport, energy, the health ministries are really important. Um, and then, you know, the way that intergovernmental processes can help frame some of the science. And, and um, we sometimes talk about changing norms on the way we operate, um, I think is also critically important. Sometimes they can operate above countries or above the state, if you will. Um, to put forward sort of more feasible and sustainable ways and attract some of the financing um, to deal with new issues like fugitive emissions, ozone, and what have you. Um, and last but not least, connecting sort of the research institutes with the policymaking process. And I think there's a push now to bring in, you know, not just even sort of top tier research institutes, but, you know, even local universities to help address some problems at the local level. I think this will also help um, so these are really important insights, and I think will help carry us into the discussion. Now, I'd like to turn it over to um, our colleagues from IASA, and uh, um, I'd like to go maybe first to Zig and then over to Kwan to draw upon some of their experiences dealing with countries, um, both 
inside, but also outside of Asia. I think there's a lot of experience, for instance, working on the LURTAP convention um, and uh, and hear a little bit about that experience. So over to, to you, Zig, what are some of the keys in, in your experience um, to strengthening this interface? And you can, you know, deal with the, uh, Europe, but also, you know, you guys work a lot in Asia too. So so feel free to, to, to span the range of experiences. Over to you, Zig. Thank you very much, Eric. And thank you very much, uh, all those, uh, Dr. Lu and, and Bert, uh, giving us information, uh, information, your views, because they are very consistent uh, from our experience in Europe, what have, has really been important. So I would like to stress maybe a couple of uh, other factors that were not mentioned yet. And this obviously early stakeholder involvement has been absolutely essential. But what, what have been really very important from our experience working in the European, for the European Union and also for this long range transboundary evolution was uh, to, to achieve trust between different stakeholders. And this has been a rather lengthy process and it was uh, stimulated by use of models. I would, you know, we, we have heard about something very basic when we talk about air quality, when we talk about greenhouse gases, something very basic is emission inventory. And we use this word in, you know, all over like it would be given. But as a matter of fact, it took a while in Europe, for example, to establish a, an emission inventory system that would be would represent fairly complete representation of sources, would be transparent, would be open to everyone. So that across countries, the same is true actually for even within a country across regions, there is a way of compiling an emission inventory in a transparent way that you can compare emission inventories. Seems like very basic, but it took actually very long time. And one of the things that really worked has been designation of international centers, sort of neutral brokers in the whole system that would collect systematic information that was discussed among experts. So experts would decide what is important, would go away from black box methods and models and be fully transparent about what kind of data is used. Be open for critique because of course, initially, many of the stakeholders, including particular countries with their interests or industries with their interests or NGOs screaming about some of the issues. Uh, you know, everybody was putting different bits on the table, but because it was all open, accessible to everyone and put in a place that was neutral in the whole process has been tremendously helpful to establish the trust in tools, in data that is used. And what, what we didn't know in the very beginning was that it's not only about the emission inventory, but when we talk about agreements that eventually were reached and we agreed on goals to reduce emissions in order to reduce impacts, we needed mechanisms and we continue using those mechanisms of evaluating progress. And again, here, a collaboration between the science community and a place where data is being collected on a regular basis about emissions, about key elements of projections that can be compared, and everybody can look into that, is, has been extremely useful because we want to monitor progress, how the goals are achieved or not, discuss them and also set new goals. The recent discussion about the recent, I mean, especially post Paris discussion about climate change, strengthening climate change action that has materialized in many uh, places has actually uh, visualized the necessity, not only success of some of this climate policies plans or already implemented in, uh, climate policies on other dimensions, quality, for example, but it also showed that we need to continue evaluate future goals because new opportunities are being created. We can be more ambitious because we've already moved on and done something. And again, in this whole process, openness, 
and a net neutral broker for having data and modeling work has been absolutely essential. And maybe one last point uh, at this stage. The, um, and I've forgotten the last point. <laughs> so I will mention it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's uh, that's no problem, Zig. I mean, we'll have uh, plenty of opportunities to bring back in some of the points. But uh, I think one of the key things that you raised here is, you know, the openness and transparency and even having, quote unquote, a relatively simple understanding of the, the data through emissions inventories can trigger the types of uh, trust building and, and understanding and, you know, and, you know, constructive critique that can, you know, lead to to policy changes. And from that, you can, you know, begin to ratchet up ambitions. I think we see this to some extent uh, happening in the climate negotiations as there's a stronger and stronger emphasis on, you know, NDCs and MRV and transparency frameworks. Um, this type of, you know, mutual trust building through relatively simple tools, um, I think is, is really healthy. And I think it also speaks to, for instance, the great work that's being done now on this uh, this dashboard. Um, you know, I think one of the motivations for something like this is to help make the invisible in some ways visible and, and to build that trust that can lead to, you know, bigger changes in policy and action. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to, to uh, Kwan and, and, uh, um, and hear some of, uh, some of your insights, perhaps, you know, uh, even bringing in some of the biodiversity work that you're doing, because um, I think this is also an area that's opening quite rapidly. Um, over to you, Kwan. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, I think a lot has been said already about the, uh, the, the the policy interface. I can, from my from my own um, experience, uh, um, perhaps one factor that has not been emphasized yet a lot is um, uh, to have a, f a very formalized role for science to play in the decisions. So, so if you think about the many different uh, climate change uh, boards, uh, scientific advisory boards and committees which have been established across different countries. I have just uh, um, earlier this year, I joined the European Advisory Board on Climate Change, which uh, includes uh, 15, um, 15 scientists, which are part of the European climate law. And uh, we, are, we are tasked with coming up uh, for, with a budget for Europe and with an emissions target for 2040, which is then communicated to the parliament uh, and will then be implemented uh, to, the, to the commission. And I think this formalized role for a scientific board to, um, at the one hand, task with specific um, information that it should provide, but at the other hand, also uh, many of the new uh, um, uh, laws which uh, uh, connect different countries from the natural gas grid up to the uh, renewable European renewable uh, uh, renewable portfolio um, uh, law um, is then also commented uh, by a scientific body. And I think that's really an effective way uh, to, uh, to, to, to make science part of a, of a, of a yeah, of the discourse and of the decision. Uh, it's not, um, um, and that has also to do then with the legitimacy and what uh, and the trust that Zeke uh, mentioned uh, mentioned earlier. Um, uh, internationally, I feel, and moving away perhaps a little bit from the from the European situation. Internationally, I felt always that IASA has this international research hub. We had we, we have this advantage to be perceived as neutral, and can also come in into national and regional circumstances, and help uh, a local dialogue. For example, IASA is coordinating um, or is helping to coordinate together, of course, with the Chinese side, the China uh, modeling comparison uh, project with local Chinese researchers using different tools to look at costs of decarbonization in different sectors. Um, why has been IASA asked to, to participate? On the one hand, because we can provide uh, the tools which allow comparability so um, we are hosting also the data of the IPCC and the Chinese side wanted to have some similar databases where scenarios by different teams can be compared and then used in the, in the, discuss the local discussions. Um, and I think this uh, international role 
being perceived as a no, no, neutral stakeholder facilitating the discussion um, but not necessarily uh, being the solution provider is, is also an important role that science can play, and particularly uh, international institutions like, 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 uh, like, like us. Um, uh, in this context, another important aspect that I noted down during the discussion was, um, I think science has always been very effective, um, particularly at the local scale. Uh, well, it was not about communicating one solution, uh, but communicating uh, the decision space and the trade-offs between different choices that a policymaker can make, right? So, so being making it transparent uh, in in which direction. Um, uh, so, what are the what are the benefits and what are the trade-offs of different decisions? Is much more effective than telling it needs to be A or it needs to be B, uh, because then um, um, I think there's uh, this trade-off, uh, making the trade-offs visible is, is a very effective uh, science, uh, science advice as well. And then finally, um, I, uh, from the capacity building activities that we have in, in, in different countries uh, where our tools are used and, and Zeke mentioned already, I think uh, co-ownership is extremely important. Uh, so, um, uh, working together at the one hand and providing the knowledge to certain government institution, government institution is important, but they need to be also part of that development process. Um, and the way that, uh, at least in the energy modeling area, where it was most successful, where we were most successful, and where our tools are used also in the government, for example, in the government of India, was always a model where. IASA was providing, let's say, was, was, was the knowledge provider. And in addition, there was a local knowledge institution, a university or a research institution, and the government organization. The, the government organization hosted a tool, and the universities work with the government at the end in, in using that tool. And uh, we are responsible for bringing in new innovations that can then be picked up on the, at, at the local scale. This triangulation has been extremely useful um, and, and creates this co-ownership, I think, that is needed to, to increase trust and also legitimacy at the, at the end. We could, of course, continue like this, but I thought these three points might be might be might be useful. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, uh, Kwan, for sharing some of these uh, experiences. And and I think you know um, some of the key points here in terms of you know formalizing the the role of uh, science, uh, you know, through uh, committees that have um, an institutionalized place in the decision making process. Is is really important. I mean, I can imagine, you know, the first time participating in one of these committees might be quite uh, nerve wracking. But uh, I'm sure uh, as the time goes on, you realize, okay, this is uh, this is a uh, part of my uh, my job, and this is a uh, this is a uh, you know something where I can really have a, an impact on 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 people that and, and and issues I care about. Also, you highlighted, you know, once again, this role of playing an honest broker, and I think you know part of it is not being too prescriptive in the types of um, recommendations we make. And, and I think your um, description of a, a decision space where we see both as, you know, opportunities and, and trade-offs and letting people make decisions based upon that decision space is really, really critical. And then last but not least, um, this sort of co-ownership. Um, I think uh, many of us potentially experience this, uh, that, you know, having a, a model, but uh, sharing that ownership of the development of the results of that model um, with researchers and government. My own ex recent experiences working in this Thailand work has really shed light on, for me, on, on how you do this and how you open opportunities for different people to bring in their own, you know, values and judgments and, and data um, to make something that's uh, greater than the sum of its parts and then people will own moving forward. Um, so I think this is all very critical. And the last thing I'll highlight, which I think you also implied um, with the work you talked about in China, and one of the things I've seen is a lot of times working at these interface um, in other countries, a lot of times, you know, to go back to Bert's point, um, having that sort of international standing can also make sure that different people from within the country that don't necessarily always meet with each other 
can talk. So the transport agencies, the health agencies, the environmental agencies might be more inclined to come to a meeting if, you know, YASA and the World Bank is in the room, um, as opposed to if it's domestic stakeholders. So sometimes you can be a sort of focal point and also serve as an honest broker. Um, so I think these are really salient points. I'd like to now sort of shift us a little bit. We're talking about similar types of issues, um, but to uh, bring it back to Dr. Sao, I actually have a question for Dr. Sao and then uh, which came out of the question and answer. And then I want to ask him a little bit about the types of support we can offer. The question and answer question for you um, was a, about, uh, you mentioned about the private sector. So I'm going to go back to the private sector again. And, and one of the colleagues really wanted to understand in your experiences, um, how do we make sure that the, the private sector, or how do you encourage the private sector to come in an early stage and um, it, you know, what types of incentives can we provide to the private sector to join the conversation early? Yes, uh, I think this is a very good question. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so let me tell you my, our own experience. Uh, actually, first uh, I came to this workshop as a researcher, not a policy maker. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, from to time, uh, time to time, I was invited as a scientist uh, to uh, comment and to draft the policy. So. Uh, you know that in Vietnam, uh, maybe some of you you are not aware, very well aware that uh, we enacted the new law on environmental environmental protection last year. So with the new law, uh, the private sector or the industries uh, they have to do like the emission inventory first. Is this required, or they need to do a kind of uh, uh, waste management uh, policy? Uh, they need to report every year. So how do we bring them is that uh, first uh, we have to organize a series of uh, workshop or consultation with them that uh, here the law will be come into effect, uh, the timeline, and uh, they are the legal binding policy. So what they need to do is first thing. And then we, um, as the resource center, uh, my center also, we, involve, we engage with the private sector and we provide them with the technical guidelines, how to do this, how to formulate, and at the same time, the government and the resource institution also together formulate what are the incentive mechanism like the brand recognition or for the financing sector, they offer green bond for the energy reduction. So that is the initiative that we have taken with done in the past to bring with the private sector. So it is, we can say that it is a kind of win-win solution for both the government and the private sector. Thank you. That's very good. Okay, so that's that's really helpful to understand some of the private sector's incentives, you know, to highlight for them sort of the win-win opportunities. And also, you know, as Zig mentioned, you know, the emissions inventories, uh, right? And, you know, this can happen at a national level, but it also happens for businesses more and more. And I think one of the things that businesses might also realize from doing this type of emissions inventory is, you know, where where can we save energy? Right or, or where can we save on costs and you know material right? So this can help provide incentives for them to join in and yeah okay great great. So then I I got another question for you and I'm not going to let you off the hook just yet. But uh, my my question for you then is you know you've heard a lot about different um, initiatives, different research uh, that's going on. What types of support based upon what you heard here today um, can help strengthen the the science policy interface in 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 Vietnam. So for instance, we heard a lot about, you know, this work on clean air solutions uh, in um, uh, in Southeast Asia uh, and uh, the different types of uh, implementation opportunities and different types of challenges. We also heard a lot about the, the synergies and trade-offs between biodiversity, food security. What types of support would you need to, to sort of move these things forward? Uh, yes. Uh, first, uh... The results presented as the research presented as this workshop is very interesting. Some of them very much. Uh, let's say for the energy, food, and water, uh, like interlinkage research, I think they are very much uh, in line with our interest in Vietnam. And uh, actually, in Vietnam, we hope that we can bring together with the international research and results from the similar countries, Thailand or Malaysia, so that we can share the experience. So that is my my expectation. That's all. Great. So having some uh, sort of uh, regional sharing using this intergovernmental mechanism on some of these issues, and potentially, you know, 
I think Yamashita-san raised this point very early on that you know there's going to be these new scientific panels or scientific infrastructure underneath the EA net. So this might also offer an opportunity to share some of these research results more broadly with some of the countries. That's really helpful. Great. Bert, I'm going to turn the question back over to you and, and hear a little bit about, you know, and how you see EA net taking on some of these things and how that can help the, you know, strengthen the science policy interface for some of the member countries. Thanks, Eric. Before I go to uh, the ENET and also how it can help out, I had one uh, thing in my mind that I thought should be strengthened. And this is the emissions inventories to equate into the ambient air quality concentrations in the cities. Like sometimes this information is not explicitly integrated in uh, studies. What I'm trying to say is, if you decrease the emissions of certain sectors by 20%, how much would it re reduce uh, the air pollution levels in the cities? And sometimes that information is not properly, uh, how do you say, it, uh, packaged or shown to the public, but also to the policymakers. You can also do it retroactively. And I think it will be powerful. Meaning, for example, from 2000 to 2010, you know that uh, Japan or a Japanese city or a Chinese city uh, or any other city has uh, put in place some policies. Uh, you can come, if the data is available, you can come up with an emissions inventory, and then you can also show how much that kind that policy uh, resulted to reductions of uh, ambient air pollution concentrations. It's not one-to-one, -one, I realize, and it's not always easy. But if we can somehow also improve this kind of uh, uh, results or studies. I'm sure IASA, our colleagues from the Network Center, other universities would be able to have this kind of knowledge. I think, Eric, we've also had this kind of conversation in the past. For ENEP, I think it's um, definitely, it, it, it already has this robust, uh, or, or this, I always call it robust, because it has this long history and uh, ex not experience, but uh, governance framework with, with countries. Uh, so it's quite mature organization and uh, the systems are in place. If you maybe strengthen more how the scientific results of the monitoring can be communicated, as I mentioned in the opening remarks, uh, to the decision makers in the countries, then it will be, I think, more powerful. But having said that, being now a coordinator of uh, the INET for uh, some months, I've also heard some countries to say if we can get more support in terms of the monitoring itself, like the equipment. I realize many intergovernmental bodies, but also institutions will focus more on capacity building efforts. But sometimes maybe if there's a pilot program, if there's a, uh, yeah, or, or a sample uh, uh, monitoring equipment that can be used by the participating countries to investigate more, and it can be facilitated definitely by ENET or, uh, with this new ENET project fund mechanism, then it would be good for many of the countries, especially the low, the, the, the least developed countries uh, who are part of the ENET. And maybe last is uh, in terms of strengthening is uh, digitalization. Like how do we harness this uh, trend, or I don't know how you call it, Internet 2.0 or this uh, new economy, but this uh, digitalization, like every time when we go to a city, we open our smartphones, we look for a taxi, we look at the weather, we look at air quality levels. And many times the air quality levels that we have in the INET monitoring sites itself is not really integrated into the national uh, monitoring site. So I'm sure this is something that ENET can work more in the future, especially with the expansion of scope and this new project fund mechanism. But maybe what I'm trying to say is if we can find a way more to get the information from these scientific studies to more people, broadly the public, but also uh, specifically to decision makers and policy makers taking full advantages of uh, digitalization trends, I think we will be able to really advance the science policy interface. Thank you. Thanks a bunch, Bert. I think you highlighted some really important points there. The, the role of emissions inventories, both at the national and local level, to really shed light on where the different opportunities lie, and the role of uh, you know uh, uh, monitoring systems. Um, and I think, in, if I'm not mistaken, uh, colleagues from uh, ACAP 
There's, you know, research projects now on some of the low cost sensors and how they can be combined with uh, some of the uh, more expensive monitoring equipment. And then last but not least, taking advantage of digitization to really make sure that uh, different uh, groups have this information in their hands. Um, so now I'd like to turn it back over to our colleagues from uh, Yasa, uh, Zig, and, and k to to hear some of their views on the ways that some of the work that they're doing through this project can contribute to strengthening science policy interface, potentially under EANET or, or other mechanisms in Asia. Uh, Zig, over to you. Thank you very much. I would like to pick up actually on, on what Bert was uh, asking about minus 20% emissions and how it translates to benefits or concentration in the first place changes and the position. I think it has been shown and, and documented that you know, models at different scales can be showing what the implications will be. And we have been working, as I indicated earlier, extending capacity of the GAINS model also to deal with this kind of questions at the fine scale and, and larger scale also. But what I want to highlight, and this is also linking to what Dr. Kao was saying earlier on, that we worked in Vietnam also uh, as part of the World Bank project on the PMEH, the, the Pollution Management Environmental Health Program. And what we realized there, what is really essential is that these models have to be validated, validated in light of the discussion that is taking place locally, regionally. So we have to make sure that the models reflect local issues and not are coming with what we think is important, but really listen and involve in the, in the conversation. And what is absolutely essential is that the local monitoring and modeling is also done in parallel. So obviously monitoring has to be done locally. It has to be recognized by the institutions, governments and strongly supported. And the local modeling is also super important. So what we've done in Vietnam, we, we teamed up with Academy of Sciences with the University of uh, Hanoi and worked together to do a parallel modeling at different scales and actually try to utilize that knowledge in our models also. So that was a process of building trust, but at the same time, capacity building, developing infrastructure, establishing a better monitoring network that would validate results of own local models developed by the uh, local uh, science community and our models. I think it created a really nice package. Of course, we faced then difficulties of uh, going away, going into the room and, and bringing in the results and getting something out of it in terms of implementation at the policy level. But that, of course, as I said earlier, is, is something that we need to be patient uh, and, and take the time to clarify the issues and discuss these issues. We also have to be aware that models can make uh, can inform us about the implications of us various decisions. But it's up to the policymakers to make choices about, and they are responsible for that, what is the target, how far they want to move and how quickly, what are the costs associated with, with these targets. And I think this discussion between the science and the policy is, uh, has been happening, but it takes more time. It has to continue. And I hope that this kind of meetings like today will allow us to find further avenues of collaboration to strengthen the science, improve that, include new elements, but also reach out effectively to the policy community. Many of us have different entry points to the policy community, and I think we have to exploit possibilities to work together in, in a joint effort, both at the local and regional level. And the last element, what has been really, uh, what I wanted to stress is that what has been very important in, in some of my past experience is that this openness, I mentioned that already before, is also translated into a um, consultation process that might come up at some later stage so that the modeling community and stakeholders, both industry and also national or regional stakeholders, are actively involved in a process of consultation of the results and data. And if we look into a longer term even and think about an international agreement and discussion, this could be one of essential mechanism of having these consultations that actually are absolutely fair to everyone and would 
help to make effective decision, decision for, for solving uh, transboundary also pollution problems. Because the problem with the transboundary pollution problem is that it brings in unevenly distributed burden on actors. And this cannot be just put on the table and say, go and do it, but it needs a lot of discussion, understanding, and also building mechanism of supporting each other to achieve that goal that actually supports everyone eventually, but there are inequalities in terms of who is putting how much into the basket. But there's also inequalities or benefits differently distributed across all the parties. And it takes time to actually get there, just speaking from the European experience. Thank you. Thanks a bunch, Zig. I think that you offered some interesting points here. I mean, I think, you know, potentially, you know, working with the EA net colleagues to try to uh, build emission inventories and more clearly see some of the opportunities and some of the benefits is really important at different levels of analysis and how they interact. Um, and, you know, once again, emphasizing this point on co-ownership and co-design. I mean, just to highlight, uh, our colleague Miho Kame spoke earlier, and she's worked a lot, and she implied this in, in Da Nang in Vietnam, and I think they have done a really nice job of this co-design type of process, and it some, sounds similar to the work you guys have done with the World Bank. Um, so maybe thinking more about how co-design can sit underneath the EA net um, would be really important, as well as this consultative and, and deliberative process of engaging different stakeholders um, will be really important to making sure that the, the research really resonates with the different people at different levels. Um, I'd like to now turn it over to uh, to Kwan and actually we'll before we close off we're going to go back to Dr. Dr. Kao and then uh, then we'll close off for the day but Kwan over to you. Yeah, thank you, Eric. I mean you asked before also um, what can we as scientists do in our work to improve our, our policy impact? I think, I think. Uh, uh, so let me very quickly um, emphasize perhaps two important research priorities that might bring science even closer in terms of the uh, utility of the outcome to the to the policy making. One is the whole area that you introduced also in your presentation. Uh, better understanding what is feasible in which context, uh, institutional dimension, soft factors, preferences of humans, and really include that in um, uh, quantitative modeling. So we are going into that direction right now, and perhaps this is even a, a possibility to collaborate, Eric, on, in, in, on this. Um, it, this means also to bring in um, surveys, information about um, how, what are the determinants of choices of people and, uh, and get this better uh, into, into our analytical work, because then uh, you can also provide decision makers, uh, sorry for the dog in the background, <laughs> I hope you don't hear it. Um, so the, the, other, uh, the, the other thing that I wanted to, uh, the, the other, I think, critical um, need is to move more from the uh, from this uh, from from science and from systems analysis, which is dominated on the on the supply side, to better understanding what's happening on the demand side. So, how can we improve the service for the individual? Uh, because we also understand now much better that the demand side transformation is more rapid. Um, it is. Uh, it relies on granular technology. Therefore, the innovation pace is also much higher at the demand side. And it's also about uh, democratization of some of the services that provide a better service to more people, which also needs this demand side change. And that's connected to digitalization, uh, circularity and the shared economy and how to introduce this. I, I think we need to better implement those things in our analytical frameworks. Um, uh, um, also there, we are moving very rapidly in this direction, but formal representation of how levels of digitalization could improve uh, the ability to share, and then also an understanding who, to whom, what service is acceptable would be, I think, really a major, major, major step in the right direction. Thank you. Thanks a bunch, Kwan, and I, I fully agree on the bringing in some of these social dimension, feasibility dimensions, and also capitalizing on digitalization to better understand demands and, and needs from different stakeholders, I think is also direction that we're all moving. 
Um, and uh, I really appreciate the fact that you guys are also moving in direction. Um, I think uh, I'd like to just bring it back to uh, Dr. Sal for uh, uh, one uh, last comment, and then uh, uh, we'll close off for the day. But uh, this is a workshop that continues. Uh, so uh, please join us again next year as well. Dr. Thank Sal. you, Dr. Eric. Actually, I just want to have two points regarding uh, Dr. Z Zikwik. Uh, uh, first, because my first uh, comment from uh, Dr. Eric is that because uh, he wants to ask from the policy maker point of view. So now I would like to talk to you about the, uh, as a researchers. Uh, first, uh, last year, uh, in the last two years, uh, my team, we did a uh, uh, murdering of ambition in uh, ambition source in the northern part of Vietnam. And we what we found out is that uh, still there's a big gap between the uh the results because uh the problem is that uh you i think you knew with the adb work that uh, uh we um the fact is that we didn't have much uh facility level monitoring uh, equipment so we lack many data so that is uh, one of the problem the second point here is that uh, uh from top down uh the monitoring we need some kind of uh, calibration and uh, validation so that is related to the question that to the point that I totally agree that we need to exploit a joint research between international and local researchers to bring together we have the local situation and here you develop the model and so then we can together develop a kind of uh, localized modeling so that we can provide the best uh, results of the Monitoring uh, results occur with the highest accuracy possible, with the feasibility, so that we can provide with the authorities that here we have the what are the major emission source, so that we can map out what are the major emission source, and we can even we can map out the pollution area based on that. The policy would be formulated and would be more effective. So that is exactly we are working in my center. So because it is my last comment. So I just want to mention that. So after this workshop, please stay in touch. I will uh, email to you to discuss about, our, about the possible future collaboration. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Zhao. I think that's a really nice way to, to close things off for right now with this invitation to talk more with you about how we can work with colleagues in Vietnam. I think this has been a tremendously rich discussion today. And uh, I really think we've benefited from uh, uh, different perspectives, uh, but uh, some points that come through, I mean, uh, this uh, idea of working as an honest broker and the fact that uh, EANET is evolving and, and moving in a way that uh, can potentially provide spaces uh, for deliberation, discussion, and uh, create opportunities for uh, collaboration, I think is, is really, really important. Um, and uh, that means across uh, different stakeholders, across different sectors, across different countries. Um, uh, at this point, uh, I would like to uh, uh, thank everybody for attending today. I think at one point we had about 77, 78 uh, researchers, uh, policymakers, and uh, general public. Um, I'd like to thank our colleagues from uh, YASA, who I believe got up around 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning. Uh, this includes uh, Kwan's uh, dog as well. Uh, it was very nice uh, that he could participate. Um, and uh, I would really, really, really like to extend our heartfelt appreciation to some people um, behind the scenes uh, who did not present today, but were instrumental to making sure that this workshop uh, uh, landed smoothly. Uh, so this includes uh, our colleagues, uh, Kazuko Namba. Uh, this also includes uh, Sakurai Shikano and uh, also includes uh, uh, Yano-san. Uh, uh, all of these people uh, really made sure that the workshop uh, moved on time and uh, they also should uh, get some, uh, hopefully some good rest tonight. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, with that, uh, I'd like to once again say thank you to, to everybody for attending. And uh, we look forward to uh, uh, participating uh, uh, more in this discussion. And I believe at the very end of the workshop, uh, you will see online uh, survey. Uh, please do fill out the survey so we know what we did well and what we could do better in the future. Uh, and uh, please do look on the, our website for uh, updates on what was learned here today and how we hope to move forward. Thank you again, everybody. <laughs>